It's clear that we're winning enough states to reach 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency. When the count is finished, we believe we will be the winners. Joe Biden sounding optimistic two days after Election Day, and the election is still undecided. Biden currently leads 253 electoral votes to Donald Trump's 214. Biden expanded his lead yesterday after winning Michigan's 16 electoral votes, Wisconsin's 10, and three of Maine's four, Trump won the other. We're still awaiting results from several battleground states. Right now, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Nevada, North Carolina, all too close to call. Arizona, too early to call. So here we are. Good morning and welcome to Morning Joe. It is Thursday, November 5th. Along with Joe, Willie and me, we have White House reporter for the Associated Press, Jonathan Lemire. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent and host of Way Too Early, Casey Hunt. We will never let her stop working. <laughs> and host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton is with us. So first to Pennsylvania. Let's go right there. Joe Biden has cut into Donald Trump's lead significantly. Around this time yesterday, Trump led by some 700,000 votes. Now with 89% of the expected vote in, Trump now leads by just over 164,000 votes, with a lot of mail-in ballots still being counted. We could look specifically at Philadelphia County, home to a lot of Biden voters. He currently leads by 60 percent, and we are still waiting for more than 244,000 votes from Philadelphia County. Biden is currently at 79 percent. <throat> Hillary Clinton won Philadelphia County with 82 percent in 2016. We're also waiting for about 80,000 votes from Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh is located. Biden currently leads by 19 percentage points in that county. And over in Bucks County, the state's fourth most populated county, where unemployment rates and deaths per capita linked to COVID are some of the highest in the country. Trump currently leads by just over 3,200 votes, with 58,000 votes still expected. Trump lost Bucks County by less than one percentage point back in 2016. And while we're uh, talking about, uh, about uh, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and the state of Pennsylvania, Willie, uh, let's just, if, if we look at some of the numbers that I just uh, had sent to me, uh, big difference in 16. In Montgomery County, Biden's up by 26. Uh, that's up from 21. Uh, several uh, four years ago in Chester he's up by 17 that's up uh, about for Hillary Clinton's 9% Delaware by 23 that's also up and uh, bucks will uh, end up likely being a wider margin uh, than 16 but but Pennsylvania is one of those states that if you look at the trends and you see where it's going and uh, it's been going th that way for the past couple of days uh, it looks like that's a state where Joe Biden's going to catch up in much the same way he caught up in Wisconsin and Michigan. If, again, as I keep saying, the past is prologue, it looks like he's going to have enough votes, uh, which he's getting at, at a quick enough, enough clip uh, that he could catch up. Georgia's a little tighter. Georgia, we're going to go down, I mean, that's, we're going to go down to the last 10,000 votes there. Uh, Biden can uh, catch up there, most likely uh, will get very close, if not uh, go ahead by five, ten thousand votes. Uh, but then you look at Arizona, uh, that's actually going in an opposite direction. Uh, and it's Donald Trump who's picking up votes at a pretty good clip. They still have quite a few to count there. And uh, the, the votes that are coming in in Arizona, we're looking, of course, at Pennsylvania right now, but the votes that are coming in in Arizona are ballots that were dropped off at the end. Uh, and if Arizona is anything like Florida, as far as uh, the waves of voters, uh, the closer to the election, uh, those ballots are dropped off, those absentee ballots are dropped off, uh, the more likely voters are uh, to be voting for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And certainly in a batch that was released last night, we saw an almost 60-40 split uh, in favor of Donald Trump. And the president's going to need to continue on that pace 
Uh, again, uh, I think Steve Kornacki said he's going to have to pick up 59 percent of all votes uh, that remain in Arizona to uh, overtake Joe Biden. So that's yeah. going to be a close one. Yeah. And then, of course, Nevada later on today, which the Biden camp feels extremely confident about. They feel extremely confident about that. Arizona still confident from the Biden camp, but you're right, as those come in, they get a little bit less confident. Arizona is still too early to call. Right now, Joe Biden leading President Trump, as you said, by about 68,000 votes, still waiting for votes from all important Maricopa County. The election department for Maricopa, which is Arizona's most populous county, tweeted overnight about 275,000 ballots still to be counted, plus provisionals, adding more results will come at 7 p.m. local time today. Not clear when other counties in Arizona will report out their latest figures. But Jonathan Lemire, this is a place, as you know, that the Trump campaign in the White House is focusing very closely, the state of Arizona. We've seen some of his supporters out chanting, count the votes, count the votes there. Obviously, in other states, they're saying, stop the count, stop the count. So they should make up their mind about whether or not they want <laughs> the that? votes to be counted. <laughs> but Jonathan, <laughs> how, um, how close does the White House think Arizona is? It may not matter if Joe Biden wins Pennsylvania today. He's got enough to go over 270. So where is the White House focused this morning? The White House's focus is sort of in the closing days of the campaign. It's pretty scattershot. It's a lot of places at once. But you certainly hit the two states that they're most zeroed in on right now. Arizona to start. And we should note, uh, the Associated Press uh, and Fox News have already called Arizona uh, for, for Joe Biden. And that's something that has enraged uh, the Trump campaign. We, they, we have they've spoken mm -hmm. publicly about it. Um, there's been, we have reported that the night on election night when Arizona uh, first went, was Fox News made that first call, that, that set a chill through through the president's watch party in the East Room of the White House. Um, that is one, as you said, that they believe that they can pick up the number of votes um, needed to flip it. And certainly it's where they're trying to contest this election right now. Uh, they feel that, uh, that they have the ability to change this, even as the votes come in from Maricopa County. Uh, but it should be noted, there's been also a lot of second guessing in Trump world about Arizona. That's a state that loomed for a while now as a problem. And some members of the campaign, including Brad Parscale, who, of course, uh, was demoted over the summer, uh, back in the early days of 2020, suggested the president needed to spend more time there. They saw some early warning signs uh, there. And the president was reluctant to do so, in part because uh, he didn't like traveling out west. He is so reluctant to spend any nights away from his own bed uh, that he didn't want to be out there, which would require an overnight stay. Uh, the other focus is Pennsylvania. And the math here is obvious. They feel they need para Arizona and Pennsylvania in order to keep any sort of feasible legal challenge going, to have to show that they still have a possible path to 270. Uh, Pennsylvania, the, their campaign, campaign manager Bill Stepien, declared victory in Pennsylvania. On a conference call of reporters, he declared victory. We all know that's not how this works. Uh, but he did that. His, the Trump campaign had a news conference in Philadelphia that featured Rudy Giuliani, among others. They made that same claim. Uh, they believe they have enough votes to squeak out a victory there, but they acknowledge they're growing more pessimistic by the hour uh, as the numbers come in, that Pennsylvania will be very, very difficult. And as a final point, you're right. We're seeing sort of an incoherence in their legal challenges right now. There are three states, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Michigan, where they're trying to stop the count. In Arizona, they're trying to keep it going. And it shows right now just a real fear uh, that, in, in, that today uh, this race is slipping away from the president. <clears throat> Well, and there is a legal incoherence, Mika, and you, you saw it. Republicans, there are no Republicans taking uh, That's right. Taking these challenges seriously. Mitch McConnell, as well as uh, other senators, have, step, Maryland's governor. have stepped forward. Of course, yeah, Larry Hogan in Maryland have stepped forward, and uh, you, you had Rick Santorum uh, on CNN, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Christie when he was on ABC. A lot of the president's steadfast resoundingly report, reporters. Resoundingly pushing back. Yeah, resoundingly pushing back for good reason, because <laughs> they understand the consequences of undermining the rule of law. The, well, president, the president does not understand the consequences of undermining the rule of law, and he's made that perfectly clear over the past four, five years, or some would say over the course of his entire adult life. But in this case... Uh, the fact that he's having such a scattershot approach uh, where he's demanding the stopping of counting in states where he's uh, ahead mm -hmm. uh, are, are, in Michi the case of Michigan, uh, falling behind further by the, the hour, uh, and then demanding the counting of votes of states where he's behind, that 
has legal consequences. When federal judges see that sort of scattershot approach, that sort of uh, intellectually uh, incoherent uh, uh, legal argument, uh, then that does have legal consequences uh, for those challenges. That's why uh, I, I don't think anybody that I've spoken with uh, in, in the legal community sees any merit to any of these claims. So we are, we are a far uh, four stretch uh, from uh, the legal challenges of 2000. Uh, right now, there don't appear to be any that are going to be significant. Yeah, I mean, someday it'd be great to talk to some of these gentlemen and ask them what made this different <laughs> than other things that they have stood by quietly. But uh, a resounding pushback to the president's efforts and, and members of his family, the president's family, were holding little press conferences around the country, screaming accusations of voter fraud right and left. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, it was... It was kind of interesting and, and well, it's not sad inter it's, sa it's sad and pathetic. It I was mean, weird. <laughs> yeah, it was they're, sad. They're Bush League amateurs. Very, they've, always, they've always been Bush League amateurs and they yeah. stumbled they stumbled into the White House through uh, what Donald Trump, the remarkable campaign he was able to run in 2016. Well, no and matter right what now, you think of it, yep. Well, it was an incredible campaign. It was. It was. I, it, nobody expected him to win uh, and it was the, I, probably the greatest upset in American history, but yes. there, there have been, uh, 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 as you said, family members and others who just embarrass themselves are yeah. not helping the cause at all. And in fact, Donald Trump's not helping his own cause legally when he's holding You're these right. ranting press conferences. I mean, he can do whatever he wants to do. He's the president of the United States. But the press conferences, uh, uh, the scattered shot approach, as Jonathan Lemir said, does not help his cause, not even legally, not, not even politically on places like Fox News where they're even telling members of the Trump administration, this is America, you have to count the votes. So let's get back to the states here. Georgia is too close to call this morning. A new batch of votes just came in and President Trump, his lead, has narrowed to just over 18,000 votes in Fulton County. That's home to Atlanta. There, at least 7,500 absentee votes still to be counted. At 10.15 p.m. last night, Georgia's Secretary of State said several counties were still counting ballots, and there were about 90,000 ballots still outstanding, numbers that will certainly update with this latest batch of votes. Rev, so today could be a big day, Joe. Yeah, well, today is going to be a big day. And uh, so, Rev, we can put these states in different buckets. Philadelphia right now, again, if you just follow the trends of Wisconsin and, and Michigan, it certainly looks like Donald Trump is going to catch, uh, or Joe Biden's going to catch and overtake Joe Biden there. You look at Arizona, well, <clears throat> you know, uh, Donald Trump, I think is going to continue getting closer and closer uh, to Joe Biden it, as as they count those remaining votes. But in Georgia, we're at a virtual tie already. The new batch of votes put Donald Trump within 17,000 votes. You do the math, it looks like Joe Biden probably is going to catch him this morning and go ahead by 10,000, 20,000 votes. That is the way it appears at this point, uh, very much so. I think. The thing that comes to me, uh, you and I are Baptists, the preacher in me looks at the fact that Donald Trump probably personifies the most racist, xenophobic, sexist administration we've seen in our lifetime. And it may end up, uh, just as Jim Clyburn and blacks in South Carolina brought Joe Biden into victory in the nominating process. It may be black districts in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and Fulton County in Georgia that brings them over the top in the Electoral College, which would be a fitting way uh, for us to uh, end the Trump administration, if it all pans out that way. Uh, I'm watching it very closely, but I think uh, you and I exchanged texts yesterday when we saw what happened in Wisconsin and the vote in Kenosha helped to bring Wisconsin over uh, for uh, uh, The Joe irony Biden. of it all, Rev. The irony of it all. Yeah. Kenosha, of all places, put Joe 
Biden over the top. And, and that is where Jacob Blake was shot by a policeman in the back seven times. And a man came in, a young uh, militia guy, and shot and killed two people in Kenosha. And the exactly. president came in and never condemned it right there in Kenosha. And Kenosha delivered the victory in Wisconsin for Joe Biden. Only Joe, you and I on the morning's bench would understand what that really means to us as Baptists. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, let me ask you this. You, you had said that the president uh, has, uh, has been racist, uh, uh, and, of course, you're not alone. The majority of Americans, according to several polls over the last few years, have said that Donald Trump is, in fact, racist. So I have this question that I think uh, a lot of people, a lot of civil rights leaders like you and a lot of Democratic politicians are, are going to have to grapple with. And that's a fact that a guy who has made common cause with uh, the Proud Boys, with white nationalists, uh, who drew praise from David Duke uh, and Richard Spencer and, and other, uh, others and neo-Nazis after Charlottesville, who's acted abhorrently uh, and used race, actually, uh, as a wedge issue, received 20 percent of uh, the vote of black men, according to exit polls. Now, we, we need to wait. And, and see, the, you know, sometimes the first exit polls aren't as accurate. There will be more in-depth studies, but 20 percent. And this morning I saw the headline uh, in the New York Times, get this, Hispanics deliver Texas for Donald Trump. What's going on? Uh, you look especially at votes uh, along the border and Hispanics broke hard. I think Hillary Clinton won Hispanics by 60 percent in that area. Uh, Donald Trump won them by 5%. So Donald Trump uh, outperformed uh, how most Republicans uh, perform among Hispanics, a group that he's derided as breeders, uh, that he's locked uh, their children in cages, uh, and has once again uh, been racially insensitive at best. So what's going on there? I, 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 for one, I hope those numbers go down a little with black men once Fulton County comes in in Philly. But notwithstanding it, he has done better than uh, he, uh, in my judgment, should have with black men and Hispanics, which means that we've got to really look in the civil rights community, both on the Latino and uh, the uh, African-American side, on a real conversation in our communities on what it is to be different in terms of being entrepreneurial aspirants and being fair in terms of how we look for the whole. I think he appealed to some that wanted to uh, feel that they had to be a certain kind of way to be aspirational, and you can be that and still be centrist. And I think that a lot of them bought into the uh, false uh, a view that they were putting out that uh, Joe Biden uh, with the crime bill, uh, rather than dealing with the fact Joe Biden was going along with the majority of people, even in black leadership with the crime bill, and uh, distorting Kamala Harris's record, and distorting that they were some kind of socialist. And I think a lot of that was brought into in terms of false propaganda and with no real pushback and direct answers. So. I really believe there's going to have to be a lot of work in those areas to ignore it or act like it doesn't matter, I think is not wise. And I think Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, if they're successful, are going to have to really work. They're going to inherit a country that is in a pandemic with a low economy. They're going to have a rough road, and they're going to have to really deal with bringing everybody no together to deal with it. It will not be something that you would really want to win if you want to have an easy <laughs> three or four years. It really won't be. No, it, nope. It's going to be a tough four years, and I said that before the election. The economy is going to crash in 21. I, whoever wins uh, is going to have a... The after a, effects a, a, the of after effects of, of all of this is the dominoes fall. So whoever ends up winning this race is going it, to, it's just going to be a tough job. And they're probably going to say, did I really want to do this? I, I want to follow up, though, because it's so important, Mika, what Rev just said mm -hmm. about, for instance, entrepreneurs, Hispanics who are entrepreneurs. I, it reminds me uh, several years ago of, of 
uh, you know, uh, gay Republicans. And people say, how in the world could you be a gay Republican? And the answers would usually be this. Well, okay, I'm gay. I'm also an entrepreneur. I'm also uh, a Catholic. I'm also a this. And then they would tick down the list. They say, yes, this is one part of me. This is one part of who I am. But I'm not going to disregard the other things that I am as well. Uh, and, and it's the same thing with Hispanics. Uh, you know, you say, yeah, I'm a Hispanic, I'm also an entrepreneur, I am also a Catholic, I'm also conservative, I'm also pro-life, I also believe in traditional family, I also believe in this, I also hate Castro, I also... All of these things, when you start saying that and you're a Hispanic, the Democrats in the past have just shut you off. Yeah. And they have just ignored it. And again, I, I try to bring these things up and I'm like, people get really upset about it. The fact is, let me say it again. Miami Day turned out the way Miami Day turned out to be because Cuban Americans hate socialists. Let me yeah. say that again. Cuban Americans, Nicaraguans who've come to America uh, and, and Venezuelans who have come to America. They hate socialism, and you may not like that on Twitter, but you might better just keep your head buried in Twitter and not run Democratic campaigns, because until you understand that, until you understand what Rev and I have been saying for years, that black Americans are conservative with a small C and not woke, not latte liberals, as the Rev says, until you understand that, you're going to keep getting surprised as this country becomes more diverse. Those votes aren't automatically going to come to you as a Democrat. You've got to go to them and understand them, their lives, how they're living, why they may hate socialism, why they may hate Castro, my, why they may hate uh, Ortega, why they may hate what's been going on in Venezuela. You got to understand that instead of from your woke uh, castle in in <laughs> New York City or, 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 or your ivory tower or whatever uh, outrageous uh, uh, imagery we can we can uh, grab. You, you, you got to understand this. It's a reality. Why is it so important now? Go read the New York Times headline. Mm -hmm. Hispanics deliver taxes to Joe Biden. All the white voters that we've been talking about for the past year or two in the suburbs, all of those gains for Democrats were erased by Hispanics in Texas who left the Democratic Party and voted for Donald J. Trump. It's complicated. You can't figure it out on Twitter. You actually got to go to where they live. And when they tell you something that you disagree with, it might be better to just dig write deeper. it down, <laughs> dig deeper, try harder, figure out how you get them back to the Democratic side. So Republicans on Capitol Hill are increasingly confident about their chances of holding a slim majority in the Senate. Right now, the GOP has 48 seats compared to Democrats' 47. <laughs> there are still five races that haven't been called. North Carolina is too close to call this morning. Wow. Now. In Georgia, one race is too close to call and the other is heading to a runoff. Arizona Senate race is also too early to call, although Mark Kelly has declared victory. Alaska is also too early to call. Yesterday, Democratic Senator Gary Peters was able to hold on to a seat in Michigan. And in Maine, Republican Senator Susan Collins was declared the apparent winner of her race. Casey Hunt, what races are standing out to you? Which ones that are too close or too early are you watching and why? Well, let's also, I just want to take a beat. I mean, Susan Collins, people know. wrote her off for dead. I know. And, I, you know, honestly, <laughs> I never did. And I hope if, you know, if you spin through the tape of, of what we've said about her on this show, I, I, she was always the one that we thought would be able to stand on her own apart from President Trump. And Joe Biden won the state mm. of Maine and Susan Collins uh, carried the state uh, for herself. So, 
Uh, you know, that that is that is remarkable. Uh, but setting that aside, really I mean, we've got is. a couple things going on here. Um, one uh, in on, on the governing question. I mean, it's clear that this this is a split decision in terms uh, or at least it's becoming clear. I should say I want to be a little bit more careful since we haven't called the presidential race or the Senate. But the trend lines are emerging that we are headed for uh, what's likely to be divided government. I mean, even if if Democrats were to improbably take the Senate it would be so, so narrow. This is not the sweeping victory that Democrats anticipate. A, a broad mandate to institute sweeping changes in policy. This is going to be a story likely about Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell and what their relationship is like. But to stick with the campaign for a second, uh, you know, the, we are watching Georgia. And I've been obsessed with Georgia for the last week of the campaign. And it's really bearing out in these two Senate races. We know one's going to a runoff. But all of my sources, both sides of the aisle, saying we really don't know how Georgia is going to come out here. It is so, so close at the presidential level. And the question is, is that other Senate race going to go to a runoff or not? Is one of those uh, candidates going to get over 50 percent, which is what it would take? I think you could see one or the other ask for a recount to try and adjust that 50 percent number to try to avoid or to push the race into a runoff. So that's something to keep an eye on. But, but there is a possibility, if we have two runoffs, that the majority could be on the line in Georgia in those runoffs uh, in, in the first week of January of 2020. That's going to mean millions of dollars spent. We're all going to know all the names of all the counties uh, in Georgia. We're going to be talking about uh, those Buckhead moms in, in Cobb County that, that mm -hmm. Joe was focused on uh, before Election Day. Uh, but Democrats, uh, potent, you know, have a, a, a lot at stake in this Purdue Ossoff outcome uh, in that Senate race because they they need both of these seats if they uh, want to hit uh, 50 in the Senate. Most likely, we're still waiting for uh, some some numbers out of Alaska, but a lot on the line in Georgia, Mika. And Casey, I'm just looking at these latest numbers out of Georgia. I mean, they're teetering. Purdue is right on that 50 percent line, so we'll see if he gets it gets above 50 to avoid the runoff. But to your question about governing, let's say for arguments. Sake, Joe Biden does find another state today and does get to 270. He does become the next president of the United States. Let's say, for argument's sake, you do have a Republican Senate. Um, what do the next four years look like? Divided government uh, back in Washington. Does anything get done? Mitch McConnell's already talking about a big uh, relief package that he wants to get done before the swearing in of the next president. What does government look like in Washington the next four years? Well, Willie, I, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of gridlock. I mean, we have seen a lot of, um, you know, it's been it's been a really challenging four years, incredibly partisan. Congress has tried to do big. I mean, how many times have we talked about an infrastructure package that, you know, yeah. both sides seem to to agree on, but that they can't figure out how to do because the politics have been so toxic. So I think, you know, it's it's likely that dynamic is going to continue. Now, the one question that I have here and again, you know, Joe Biden, if we're, we're sticking with your argument that he's in the White House, he is a senator at, at, at his core, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he has wanted to be president his entire life, but he is a creature of the Senate. He understands how it works. He loves it. He loves the institution. He has very strong relationships. Uh, there are fewer, you know, people that he served with now who are still serving in the Senate, but he has very strong relationships. He understands how those relationships can be applied and leveraged to actually get things done. And this is going to be very, very different from, I mean, Barack Obama did not have a good relationship with Congress for most of his administration. No. I mean, he forced health care through at the beginning. It was his one big achievement. And I mean, even Democrats were very frustrated with working with him. President Trump has not, you know, I mean, he has, he has been dealing with, obviously, Republicans in Congress who have towed the line with him, but it has not been a successful relationship. I think it could be under Joe Biden. I think the question's going to be, will progressives in the Democratic Party let Joe Biden cut the kind of deals that he might be willing to cut with a Mitch McConnell uh, in order to actually really govern? Point. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of my question yeah. going into this. So, Casey, I, I want to follow up on that because it's so important. I, I, again, people right now are thinking it's the end of the world as we know it, even if Joe Biden is elected president and Mitch McConnell is running the Senate and Nancy is running the House. You are right. To his core, Joe Biden uh, is, uh, is a, a senator who understands it takes compromise. You have to work with people who disagree with you. It, 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 he, it's the antithesis of the view uh, that uh, Donald Trump had about Congress 
And Barack Obama, he may have been there for a couple of weeks. He didn't have much use for or of Congress. And to be really blunt, and Willie and Mika will confirm this, uh, in the first couple of years of, of his administration, we heard such complaints from Democratic senators, the most powerful, that Barack Obama treated them without any respect whatsoever. George W. Bush, forget about it. That guy had no use for Congress. They treated Congress with absolute contempt as well. Uh, you go back to Bill Clinton, of course. Bill Clinton, you could you could impeach a guy on Tuesday. Yeah. He'd call you up on Wednesday and go, hey, you want to go out and golf? <laughs> Bill Clinton got it. That's a little too much. Bill Clinton worked, understood. Worked the There's much. always the next vote. Okay, you lost the yep. last vote. The guy made you mad. The woman made you mad. Get, we got another vote coming up this week. I got to keep that relationship going. Mm -hmm. That's what Joe Biden, if he's elected, he's will bring. So I agree with you, Casey. People that are saying, oh, Mitch McConnell and Joe Biden, that's going to be the worst relationship ever. It may not be perfect, but it's going to be a hell of a lot better than the relationships we've seen over the past 20 years between a White House and Congress, even if it's a bipartisan uh, uh, combination. I, I think that's absolutely right. Mitch McConnell and Joe Biden have a relationship. And, you know, they've downplayed it because, frankly, progressives don't want to hear that. I mean, Mitch McConnell is probably maybe even the most hated uh, Republican uh, politician uh, for, for many uh, on, the, on the left who are really focused in on his role on, you know, the judiciary and, and other areas. But, you know, if you look back to, Joe, what the Obama administration did do with Congress in its second term, Guess who was the person that did all of those deals, that did all of the work that we were chasing through the hallways of the Capitol? It was Joe Biden working with Mitch McConnell in, when they had divided government in that second term. And, you know, frankly, uh, some of that's generated anger. Some of the work that was done there has generated anger among, among Democrats. But, you know, we'd be misleading people if we didn't say Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell have had a successful working relationship in the past. And to think that that's not going to define in a significant way any divided government you know, that, that, that a, a Biden administration's presiding over is simply ignoring the realities. I mean, and, and Joe, you guys have had Joe Biden on here so often. I mean, this is, this is his bread and butter. This is what defines who he yeah. is as a politician, how he, he does things are these relationships, and they're very strong. And yeah, one, he and loves one, it. He does. And one final thing, Mika, it reminds me uh, all the complaining that there's not going to be one party rule in Washington, D.C. over the next couple of years. And, oh, there's going to be gridlock. And, uh, you know, uh, Tom Ricks has an amazing book that's coming out called uh, uh, First, I think it's First Principles. I, I read the book. It's an incredible book. I'm just trying to remember the title right now. I'm we'll have Tom on a lot to talk about it. But he talks about Madisonian democracy. He talks about the checks and balances. He talks about all the frustrations that that brings uh, to people who want to get things done quickly. And he quotes uh, sort of an old Silicon Valley adage, which is uh, that frustration, those checks and balances, it's not a bug. It's a feature. Th those frustrations, those checks and balances, that's why we're still here 241 years later. That's why this country is still moving forward. And for those of you who didn't think we were going to su survive Donald Trump, if we do, I'm just saying that for Mika, we're going to. Yep. If we survive Donald Trump, then we will look back and we will see these checks and balances. Again, not being a bug of democracy, being one of its greatest features. Well, and I think Casey just nailed um, the, the area for hope if Biden um, does move forward to win the presidency, perhaps even today. Uh, still ahead on Morning Joe, President Trump lays the groundwork for contesting election results in three different battleground states. We'll talk about his campaign's new lawsuits with an election law expert. You're watching Morning Joe. We'll be right back. This is a keepsake frame. This is actually a photo from my wedding. 
I'm Adam Weiss, founder and CEO of Keepsake. If you're anything like me, you've probably got 7,000 photos on your phone. And sometimes the moments that really matter most end up getting lost. That's why I made Keepsake, the mobile app that makes it easy to have your photos printed, framed, and shipped to your doorstep. So if you've got a special photo on your phone, install the free Keepsake app. We would love a chance to frame it for you. President Trump's campaign manager, Bill Stepien, issued a statement on the race in Wisconsin, saying in part, quote, the president is well within the threshold to request a recount and will immediately do so. Joe Biden narrowly won Wisconsin yesterday, but according to state law, a candidate is allowed to call for a recount if the margin of victory is one percentage point or less. The request for a recount has to be made within the window when the all county results are submitted and the following day at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Wisconsin's former Republican governor, Scott Walker, tweeted yesterday in part, quote, after a recount in the 2016 presidential race in Wisconsin, Trump's numbers went up by 131. As I said, 20,000 is a high hurdle. Willie? Yeah, when Governor Scott Walker, Republican governor, former governor, is warning the president about a lawsuit, you know it's going to be trouble. President Trump's campaign filed suit yesterday in three states where the vote count is ongoing, where the president's lead is either dwindling or gone. The campaign filed suit in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Georgia, mm -hmm. and joined existing Republican legal challenges in Pennsylvania and Nevada, where the party is challenging the handling of some absentee ballots. The Michigan and Pennsylvania suits filed yesterday sought to stop the counting until Trump campaign observers are allowed to review ballots that already have been counted. The Michigan lawsuit claims Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, a Democrat, was allowing absentee ballots to be counted without teams of bipartisan observers as well as challengers. But the Associated Press reports observing firsthand there are plenty of poll watchers from both parties in counting locations. Joe Biden was awarded the state of Michigan after the suit was filed. In addition, the president's campaign intervened at the Supreme Court in a case challenging Pennsylvania's plan to count ballots received for up to three days after Election Day. In Georgia, the lawsuit alleges that Chatham County is improperly counting ballots after the ballots received after the state's election day deadline. The campaign is seeking a court order to remind vote counters to separate out late arriving ballots. Joining us now, chair in constitutional law at the Ohio State University, Ned Foley. He's an NBC News election law analyst. Ned, good to have you with us this morning. Um, let's start in Pennsylvania, where a lot of eyes are today. We're expecting to get a bunch more vote out of that state today. It could be enough to give the state to Joe Biden, which would put him over the 270 uh, electoral vote threshold. What do you see in some of these lawsuits? Do you see merit in what the president is accusing uh, the elections board there of doing? Uh, good morning. Um, I don't think that any of the lawsuits that we've seen so far are ultimately going to make a difference in the outcome. I think when you're behind in this kind of vote counting litigation, you have to sue and sue quickly because the clock is moving and you need to do something if you're behind. But uh, they often lack merit uh, and the courts are going to reject them if they don't have merit. So, uh, you know, Pennsylvania. Uh, has some issues, but even there, I don't think in the end the, the litigation will matter. So the, the argument that we're hearing is to stop the count, stop the counting of votes in Pennsylvania, but when you go to Arizona, it's continue the count, let's get them coming in so because we think President Trump may be able to make up the difference there. What does that kind of incoherence, that dissonance between the White House argument mean broadly? Well, the standard practice of uh, lawyers in these cases is to make their arguments depending on whether they're ahead or behind. Sometimes you see the lawyers switch positions as they, as the lead switch. This happened in the Minnesota U.S. Senate race in 2008, and as soon as the lead flipped from one side to the other, the lawyers switched their positions. What we're seeing now is this inconsistency at the same time across multiple states because the same candidate is behind in one place and ahead in the other. So that's the uh, recount lawyers sort of behaving according to form. Um, the basic proposition from the uh, voters' perspective is we should have consistent counting of valid ballots. As long as 
votes are valid, they need to be counted whether they're in one state or the other, and no matter who's ahead or who's behind. And again, Jonathan Lemire will repeat what we've been saying for weeks. We're still counting ballots in Pennsylvania because this is the way the process was supposed to work. We knew this from the beginning. We knew that they couldn't start counting the mail-in and the early vote until Election Day. And so here we are watching the process play out the way it was supposed to play out legally, and the president is challenging that. That's right, and the process created uh, these delays in part because of Republican state legislatures taking their cues uh, from the White House in some ways. Uh, Ned, my question for you is we've obviously made a lot of comparisons anytime there's sort of any electoral lawsuit uh, to what happened in Florida in 2000 when the eyes of the nation fixated on that state for well more than a month. We're right now, in a, there are some legal, potential legal challenges in a number of states with the scattershot approach mm -hmm. that we've been addressing all morning. Uh, in, in some ways, does, is that going to be more difficult for the Trump campaign to sort of process and make a coherent legal argument? Because, as Willie just said, they're arguing one thing in one state, one in another. Do judges, will they see that? Will that impact the merits of their case? Are you seeing anything in any of these states that's going to lead us even potentially to the drama and the drawn out process that we had in Florida 20 years ago? Yeah, I think the reference to Florida is important. I haven't seen anything so far that looks like the hanging chads that were the focus of so much attention in Florida in 2000. In order to have a lawsuit make a difference, you've got to have a real problem to fight about. And the hanging chads were a problem, and nothing like that has emerged yet. The other thing about Florida in 2000 was just how narrow the margin was, 537 votes. You know, we're not seeing at this point, they're still counting ballots as we've been talking about, but, you know, margins of 20,000 are, are not margins of 500, and, and mar the numbers really matter in this context. And then the third point is, in uh, 2000, it was all Florida, Florida, Florida. It all turned on one state. Uh, obviously, the magic number in the Electoral College is 270, and so winning a lawsuit in one state, even if that happens, doesn't necessarily affect the entire outcome of the Electoral College uh, because multiple states are in play, as you say. Yeah, that also takes pressure off of certain Supreme Court members to rule in certain ways, not that they would ever have, polit to have political considerations uh, in making their decisions. But if one state, uh, if, if the presidency doesn't revolve around one state, uh, they, there may be a little less pressure on those individual court members. Uh, so um, let, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Foley, about Pennsylvania. Uh, I, uh, I will admit it on MSNBC. I'm a conservative, uh, and when I see uh, judges uh, rewriting election laws uh, and overtaking what the state legislature has done, um, uh, which is what happened in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, I grow concerned. Um, obviously, there are members of the Supreme Court who also uh, are concerned at that, even though they did not intervene the first time, and concerned because, of course, the Constitution says that state legislatures are going to set the election laws, not state judges. I, I'm wondering what the impact of that ruling uh, may possibly be. Is the court going to come back to it? Do you think they'll have the five votes uh, to disallow the, the votes that came in after Tuesday? Not on that point, which I think is the key point. I think there are really two issues still in the case in Pennsylvania. The first one, as you mentioned initially, is this basic legal theory under the federal constitution about whether or not, because state legislatures have the authority in the U.S. Constitution to determine the rules of elections, whether it can violate the federal constitution if a state court, as you said, rewrites the state's election laws. I do think there are going to be five votes that the current Supreme Court is sympathetic with that basic legal theory. But the second part, which you also mentioned, is what's the consequence in this election? And I don't believe there are going to be five votes to invalidate ballots already cast by innocent voters who cast their votes at the time where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's decision was in place. The voters weren't doing anything wrong. They were eligible voters. And it would be a game of gotcha, if you will, if, if their votes were invalidated. And last point on this, there was another case out of South Carolina that had a little bit of a different issue, but is a signal here. And there, Justice is Kavanaugh and Chief Justice Roberts refused to invalidate votes that voters cast in good faith. So we might see something similar to that in Pennsylvania if it comes to it.
Well, that certainly, yeah, that certainly does make a lot of sense where the Supreme Court might uh, have problems with what the Pennsylvania uh, courts did, but at the same time refuse, and they likely will, that makes sense, refuse to invalidate voters who did nothing wrong but follow what they uh, saw were the rules of their state at the time. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ned Foley. We greatly appreciate you being here. Hope. Uh, let, well, let me put it this way. We hope you'll come back, but we hope... <laughs> it's not about we, this. <laughs> we, hope, we hope it'll be under the right circumstances. Yeah. A healthy mouth is the gateway to a healthy body. That's why Quip Electric toothbrushes, toothpaste, and refillable floss make oral health simple with refills delivered every three months. Get your first refill free at getquip.com slash save15. Roxy loves Farmer's Dog. It smells good, comes in these convenient little packs. It's made my life so much simpler. This dog is my heart. I want her to have a long and healthy life. Visit betterforthem.com. Hey, you know, um, what a beautiful oh, wow. uh, view of Washington, D.C. So this nice. morning, 6.52. Uh, and the sun rising over a city that still doesn't know who will be the next president. Democrats are feeling awfully confident this morning, believing uh, that Joe Biden is going to overtake the president in uh, Pennsylvania today. Uh, Willie, I, um, I think I need to let you know something that happened around here on election night uh, when uh, we did what we've been doing since 47, 48, uh, yeah. doing yeah. election nights on Peacock. We've had a lot of surgery, uh, which is why we still look so young, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Exactly. And a very, very good diet. Uh, we both uh, decided uh, to do the Churchill diet, and it's kept <laughs> us alive for quite some time. I thought it was fun doing election night live on Peacock. It I was. I think we should do more on doing Peacock. Doing election night live, yes. Streaming. Uh, so, so uh, but anyway, at the beginning of the evening, um, while you were at the big board, mm. one of Mika's daughters. Oh, oh, uh, man. She oh, no. texted. And She's she, a big Kornacki fan. She, she okay. I, let's start Who there. Who isn't a big you know, She's you obsessed. You, 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 know, you know. know how teenage girls in the 1970s and 80s had posters of Andy Gibbs yeah. on the sure. wall? Leif She's Garrett. Got right. Yeah. Le Leif Garrett, Andy Gibbs, mm -hmm. Sean Cassidy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sure. Now, even uh, women into their 40s, 50s, 60s, what they've got the poster, of course, shirtless, buff, going like this. Angry. Of the rage. Kornacki. Yeah. Yeah. So, she popular. loves Steve Kornacki. I say this all as a very, very long windup. <laughs> yes. To, to say. <laughs> and it is a long windup. Louis so yeah. Woof. <laughs> yes. Woof. <laughs> God, Joe, just just get to it. She asked, what's Willie doing at the board? Yeah. That's Kornacki's board. What yeah. is she doing? Totally what's agree. he doing at the and the, board? And then the second text was, does he know what he's doing? Mm. And then the third and the Not fourth great was, reviews. I think. Yeah. <laughs> and no, and then she goes, I think he knows he doesn't know what he's doing and he thinks it's funny. And then the fourth text wow. was, actually, he's pretty good. Oh. Yeah. What wow. about that? <laughs> I was worried yeah. about the first three texts. Yeah, no, honestly, yeah, right. the, the board, we, we had fun doing that, but Kornacki, who we've actually, he's in his charging station right now. He'll be back, don't worry, MSNBC viewers, a little bit later today. <laughs> the charging um, station. But I mean, the, what he does up there and breaking down the numbers is yeah. absolutely incredible. He can tell you what's happening in every county and every precinct in the United States of America. So we always loved Kornacki, but when you get up and try to do what he does, your respect is even elevated a little further. Absolutely. Exactly. We're going to get you back at the board at the top of the hour. Yep. I want to talk especially about Georgia, but Rev, let me go to you uh, I uh, first, because Willie's going to be at the board. We're going to be looking at those Georgia numbers, but let's talk about Georgia. If, in fact, it goes the way it's looking right now, and again, who knows? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe the president holds on, but if Joe Biden catches up, you have to look at two people uh, making... Uh, uh, a tremendous difference. Uh, and here's the latest out of Fulton County, Joe Biden, 72.5 percent. But uh, Barack Obama's uh, last minute appeal in Atlanta was electrifying uh, to a lot of people in Atlanta. That made a huge difference. And Stacey Abrams, Stacey Abrams may have come up a little bit short 
uh, in her race in 2018. But if Joe Biden wins the state of Florida and cracks the solid South for the Democrats, uh, many, uh, many uh, uh, people have to look to Stacey Abrams and, and the organization that she's been building uh, in that state is making a huge difference this year. No doubt about it. If uh, Joe Biden wins Georgia, even if he doesn't, there's a lot uh, that is owed to uh, Stacey Abrams, who really built a statewide organization that has lasted beyond her own race. Uh, I think both Ossoff and uh, Warnock, who are potentially in runoffs, well, Warnock is in a runoff, they have to uh, give a lot of that credit to the infrastructure, the political infrastructure and the energy Stacey Abrams brought that state. It was a runaway red state until Stacey did what she did. And I think you're absolutely right that when President Obama came in a few days before and really charged that energy, I think that is what has brought it this close to what may be turning that state for Joe Biden. Yeah, and, and, and Jonathan Lemire, <clears throat> Georgia is a state that uh, election night, uh, as things were looking bad uh, for the Biden campaign, uh, th there was some discouragement about North Carolina, discouragement about, about Georgia as well. But you, you sort of sensed, I mean, I heard from you, you sensed a growing optimism inside that campaign that the trends were looking really good, just like they did. In Wisconsin, then Michigan, and now Pennsylvania. Some some Pennsylvania officials believing that Joe Biden may win that state by as many as a hundred thousand votes. Uh, but Georgia, uh, Georgia is a state that uh, the Biden campaign has got has uh, gotten more confident about uh, as every hour passes. And Joe Biden would be the first Democrat to win in Georgia since Bill Clinton uh, did. And it would be a remarkable moment and potentially one of reshaping the electoral map. I mean, North Carolina, the Biden camp believes, is probably going to stay just out of reach. But it's certainly a true battleground now, North Carolina. We've seen Obama win it uh, and then Democrats lose it other cycles. Uh, but now the Dems feel that Georgia can be that as well. They're not, not a state they'll take for granted anytime soon. They know they'll have to work. Um, but they're seeing such encouraging turnout uh, among black voters in Atlanta the Atlanta suburbs uh, that continues the trends that we saw all year long, those voters sort of breaking away uh, from President Trump and an extraordinary win, if it were to happen, from Joe Biden. It is still very close. But very briefly on one other thing, let's remember how much time we spent the last four years talking about the former Blue Wall, those three Great Lake states of, of Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan that Trump won four years ago, defeat, taking them away from Hillary Clinton. Joe Biden is now building it back up. He's got two-thirds of it already in Wisconsin and Michigan, two gigantic wins, and seemingly his camp feels on track to complete that uh, by winning Pennsylvania uh, in the coming days. Now, whether those are the start of a return to those becoming Democratic strongholds or, or not remains to be seen. There are certainly some real Democratic shifts there, but we shouldn't lose sight of that, that Biden was able to make that appeal to those sort of working-class voters, white working-class voters in those states that Trump has been successful, so successful winning but also improving turnout in places like Milwaukee, in places like Philadelphia uh, and Pittsburgh, in places like Detroit, uh, which could make the difference for him and put him at this moment just a step or two away from the White House. Um, uh, let's go to House Editor for the Cook Political Report, David Wasserman at the NBC News Decision Desk. Good to have you on board, Dave. So, so Dave, we got a lot. Uh, we got a lot to still talk about. Yeah. Uh, you haven't slept in five days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's so funny when I talked to you before the race and said, "Oh, I can't wait for this to be over." About five days before, you were smart enough to say, "Oh, I'm just resting up." It's after the election that where we're really going to be digging through it. And sure enough, here we are, Georgia, on the cusp, uh, Pennsylvania. Arizona, Donald Trump catching up quickly in Arizona, uh, Nevada. We're going to find out later today if the Biden campaign's confidence is warranted there. They're feeling really good about Nevada. Uh, but let's start with Georgia, since that's the closest right now. What trends are you seeing? Well, look, Joe, it's going to continue to get closer because the bulk of the remaining ballots that are out are in the metro Atlanta area. And, uh, and it's just going to be extremely tight. But the fact that, that Georgia is close makes it a, a real bright spot for, for Biden out of the Sun Belt states. 
Uh, does uh, does Joe Biden have enough votes? Are there still enough votes left there uh, to put Biden over the top if he uh, continues overperforming? I've been speaking with uh, with consultants on on both sides who say that uh, you know their models show that it's going to to finish pretty much near near a tie. Now I'm not going to step on our decision desk, uh, but uh, but one uh, Democratic consultant I talked to was optimistic that Biden would finish ahead by a couple thousand votes. We're simply just going to have to wait and see today. But it's clear that that Biden's best path to 270 by far is Pennsylvania. Yeah, let's go to Pennsylvania. Uh, the trend line's looking very good for the vice, former vice president there. What can you tell us about Pennsylvania? What are you seeing? Uh, Joe, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'm, I'm going to leave it to our decision desk uh, in terms of making a definitive characterization when the time is, is ready. But, uh, but when, it, when it comes to, to Pennsylvania, you have to like the trend lines a lot if you're Joe Biden. Uh, we're looking at the completed counties, the counties that are nearly done counting their vote. And of course, uh, President Trump won Pennsylvania by 0.7 uh, in, in 2016. So Joe Biden doesn't need much of an overperformance uh, in order to win. Uh, we're seeing him overperform Clinton's margins uh, by, a, by a modest amount, but a critical amount across the board. So for example, uh, in, uh, in Lackawanna County, where, where you know, the Biden campaign made Scranton uh, su such a, a, a central push, uh, Biden ended up winning it by eight points. Hillary won it by only three. Uh, you go to, to Montour County, Pennsylvania, Danville, which is, you know, in the T of the state, a pretty rural setting. Uh, Biden, uh, and this was his biggest overperformance in the state, uh, lost it by only 21, whereas Clinton had lost it by, by 29. Uh, you go to, to su suburban Philly and Chester County. Uh, you know, the, the Whole Foods revolt in Pennsylvania Oh, and across the country may not have been quite as dramatic as we would have expected before the election, but it, it still is likely en enough to power Biden to what he needs because Hillary Clinton won Chester County by 9.4%. Uh, Joe Biden is ahead there today by 16.5. So these deltas are larger than what he would need uh, on, a, on a county by county basis. And we still have hundreds of thousands of uncounted mail ballots that we'll get from some major, major counties that will break extremely pro-Biden. And Dave, obviously, if he wins Pennsylvania, Joe Biden does, this conversation becomes moot. But let's talk about Arizona and what's happening there. As more vote has come in out of Maricopa County, as we've seen more of that percentage, Joe, uh, excuse me, Donald Trump actually has picked up a little bit of ground there. How do you see that playing out as the vote trickles in from Maricopa and more broadly from the state? Yeah, well, what's interesting is when you uh, calculate what Trump needs out of these batches in order to close the gap, uh, at least uh, out of the, the remaining uncounted ballots in Maricopa, uh, Trump is getting right about at the number, maybe a tiny bit less in the batches that came out last night around, you know, uh, 2 a.m. Eastern and, and before that uh, in order to get to a tie. The concern that Republicans I speak to have is that there are also a few um, provisional ballots that uh, remain in, in the uncounted column that they believe uh, are a little bit more favorable to Biden, perhaps, than the, the ballots that uh, were in these batches last night. This is going to come down to a razor-thin margin in Arizona. And, and, uh, and look, we're simply going to have to be patient as, uh, as the county recorder uh, updates the tallies. All right, now let's move over a little bit and talk about Nevada, uh, a frustratingly slow count for a lot of people waiting to see what's going to come out of there. What exactly is going on? Why is that count taking so long? Yeah, well, look, uh, Nevada is in a, a, a similar predicament to, uh, to Arizona, where uh, Clark County, obviously, uh, you know, about th uh, three quarters of, of the state, uh, we're, we're simply waiting to see what kind of, of ballots are these that, uh, that are, are still uncounted. They could be slightly more favorable to Trump than the ballots that have already been counted, and the margin is extremely tight. Uh, you know, John Ralston uh, seems to be optimistic that Trump can make up some ground. So, look, uh, again, Nevada becomes moot if Pennsylvania ends up in the Biden column. Uh, but it does speak to the uh, to uh, the the truth that Trump did make progress with Hispanic voters on Tuesday in a, in a big way. In a big way, and, and I wanted to ask you about that. I've been talking 
uh, this morning, uh, first hour about a New York Times headline that I found to be jarring, uh, which said Hispanics deliver Texas for Trump. We've been talking for several years uh, since 2018 about the revolt of uh, the suburbs against Donald Trump, the Republican suburbs. Uh, a lot of white voters around uh, the suburbs of Dallas, a lot of white voters uh, and others around uh, Houston, those suburbs. Uh, but uh, as the New York Times article laid out, uh, any white voters that Democrats gained uh, in those suburbs were erased uh, by Hispanic voters along the border and also Hispanic borders across the state who broke for Donald Trump. That's right. And look, we're all pummeling polls right now, but polls, ironically, you know, actually did a pretty reasonable job of describing the changing contours of the electorate before the election. Uh, we knew from the numbers we were seeing that uh, that Trump was likely to see an, an improvement among Hispanic voters, particularly Hispanic men. Uh, I think when we unpack all of the numbers, we'll see that there was uh, a really large gender gap among uh, Hispanic voters. There's also a big difference between how rural Hispanic voters uh, look at, at the race and how um, more urban and central city uh, and, and higher income Hispanics uh, viewed the contest. And look, the, the margins that we saw for Biden uh, in not only Miami, but in South Texas and, the, and uh, along the border, uh, were catastrophic uh, for, for, for Democrats there. Um, I don't know that it's enough to say that it cost Joe Biden the state of Texas when the margin is hovering around six points, but it certainly played a role in, in Texas being decisively in Trump's column. Let's go to Willie. He's at the board right now. And Willie, you're looking uh, at, at the state right now that uh, both campaigns are looking at closely in the political world, and that is the state of Georgia. Yeah, I just wanted to point out to Dave, we got some new vote in from Fulton County. Look at the spread now in the state of Georgia. Donald Trump leads by 18,540 votes, and the Secretary of State, Dave Wasserman, has just said there are 25,000 outstanding absentee ballots. So it's, what is your sense of where that vote is, what percentage of it might go to Joe Biden, and how close that number might end up being? Because 18,540 right now in, in Georgia. Yeah, it's going to be extremely tight, Willie. And, uh, you know, I have to look more closely after this dump to see where the remaining ballots are from. To the extent they're from Clayton County, uh, that would be good news for, for Biden because that's an overwhelmingly African-American county. Uh, but he's going to need to really run the table on these remaining ballots statewide in order to catch up. All right, hey, let's, Will, yeah, Willie, I would, uh, yeah. Is it, it, was that was that number Willie uh, for the entire state? Yeah, this is statewide, eighteen thousand five hundred forty. That's the spread statewide, and the statewide, the Secretary of State says statewide there are fewer than twenty-five thousand absentee ballots remaining, and by the way, that they should be finished counting by noon today. So, I mean, as if you could get any closer, this probably will get down. I don't know, Dave. What do you think in the ten thousand or fewer vote spread uh, in Georgia? Yeah, I think we're talking four digits. Wow. Yeah, and, and Willie, of course, if that comes from certain areas, uh, if that comes from uh, counties that are uh, overwhelmingly black, and uh, Donald Trump is losing that uh, by a, a nine to one margin, uh, that'll be enough to get uh, Joe Biden uh, certainly close enough uh, and, and possibly move ahead by 1,000 or 2,000 votes. but. If, if it's from uh, a county that, that trends more uh, for, for Donald Trump, obviously he'll be able to hold on to Georgia. Yeah, let's, uh, let's shoot over to, uh, to Pennsylvania as well. Uh, Dave Wasserman, as you've said, as the votes come in from these suburban counties, obviously they're gonna trend toward Joe Biden. Is there a scenario you see where Trump can stem that enough to hold off the state or is this a foregone conclusion in Pennsylvania? Look, I, I, I have a very hard time seeing a comeback path for the president in Pennsylvania. There's just nowhere in the state where he's overperforming his 16 margin by enough, um, if at all, to, uh, to be able to offset the kinds of uh, defections we have seen from Trump in suburban Pennsylvania, 
uh, but not just the suburbs. Also northeastern Pennsylvania, we have seen a, a, a pretty strong uh, Biden performance in, in the Scranton area and, and the surrounding counties. We also are seeing it in the Lehigh Valley. Look, Northampton County uh, is Bethlehem. Uh, we saw Trump win that county. We saw, uh, saw him flip it from Obama uh, in 2016. It, it apparently has flipped back to Biden this time around, who has a 0.4% lead uh, in a place where I estimated uh, in my benchmarks that Biden needed to lose by three points or less. Uh, these numbers are, are really encouraging for Biden across the board. And uh, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was speaking with a, a uh, congressional Republican uh, who pays close attention to these, these numbers last night, um, who admitted that, that Trump is in deep trouble in Pennsylvania. Let's uh, bring in MSNBC contributor Mike Barnacle, chief White House correspondent for The New York Times, Peter Baker, editor-in-chief of The Atlantic magazine, Jeffrey Goldberg, White House correspondent for PBS NewsHour, Yamish Alcindor. Good to have you all on board. Uh, Jeffrey Goldberg, uh, I, I'm reading a piece in The Atlantic about the amount of people who voted for Trump and what it says about our country. Um, what do you make of the results so far? Uh, as this piece uh, by George Packer, I think that's the one you're referring to, uh, mm -hmm. says, we are a bitterly and seemingly permanently divided country. There's two Americas. We have another piece by Ron Brownstein that talks about, uh, acknowledges kind of a cold civil war. If the country is split down the middle uh, and that one side is just not understanding the other side, uh, both sides don't understand each other, and that we live in a social media media environment uh, in which uh, yes. differences are exacerbated. And, uh, you know, it's, it's um, there are a lot of people who simultaneously recognize that there's a high likelihood that Joe Biden is going to win, and then this uniquely, from their perspective, uniquely terrible president is going to go, and yet they, that they're feeling awful about the current conditions of the country. I think that's kind of the dominant mood, uh, is sort of relief uh, and also disgust. Yeah, uh, and George Packer actually will be joining us tomorrow on Morning Joe. Yeah, and uh, Mike Barnacle, uh, this wouldn't be the first time uh, that uh, that Americans have had this reaction. Of course, uh, it's you can go back obviously to the founding of the republic. You can go back to the election in 1800, which was as John Meacham, uh, who wrote, of course, an extraordinary book. On Thomas Jefferson, has long called that one of the ugliest presidential campaigns. But even in more recent times, um, Republicans uh, reacted uh, viscerally, with visceral hatred, about uh, Bill Clinton when he got elected president of the United States. George W. Bush was called a Nazi for eight years. Uh, Barack Obama, uh, you know, Donald Trump started, uh, really uh, promoted uh, the birther racist conspiracy against him. Um, we've been through some pretty tough times. It just seems to me, uh, if Joe Biden is elected president of the United States, that's the battlefield that he walks out upon politically, and it's his job to try to bring us together. And uh, don't you think, knowing him as long as you do, that uh, that's exactly uh, what he's built to do? You know, I think Joe Biden thinks and knows and feels very strongly that job number one when he gets back is to expedite a vaccine to really rid this country of the uh, virus. Uh, but the other aspect of that job that is going to be all time consuming is the one that you just described, Joe. And the Packer piece is really interesting, as you'd expect from George Packer. And it points out something that we all should be acutely aware of in this ongoing autopsy that we're going to do on the two Americas that we talk about each and every day. And this did not begin with Donald Trump. What the roots of our divisions are there long before Donald Trump. And as Jeffrey just pointed out, it, it, you just get the sense that the explosion of social media, <clears throat> Twitter and Instagram and everything that surrounds us every day in communications terms, we're inundated with it, we're flooded with it every day. And you end up talking to people who voted for Trump or who believe in Donald Trump, and you get amazingly simplistic themes about why they're divided. I was speaking to a person mm -hmm. yesterday, a Trump person, loves Donald Trump, loves what he's been doing. 
and I ask about the other side, you know, well, Joe Biden, good guy, you know, the Democrats, blah, blah, blah. And they boil it down to the following sentence. I'm tired of so many people telling me what to think, how to live, and now they're telling me what to eat. I mean, the, the, the take that, that so many people have about the interference in their own personal lives by an overwhelming apparatus of government, the flood of social media, the autopsy on this is going to be among the most interesting American experiments we've ever done, and it has to be done. <clears throat> Well, there's also, and you just have to add in there, and, and I say this as a guy who is Republican for 20, 25 years, uh, so much of that also comes from just an overwhelming sense of victimhood. Uh, I swear if I hear one more yes. uh, a friend of mine uh, who's an evangelical talking about they're coming for us and the per persecuted church, and, and I, I politely and gently remind them that over the past five years, no Supreme Court in the history of this mm -hmm. republic has done more to protect religious rights than has the Roberts Court. And I could go down one ruling after another after another. Uh, you know what? I can't help you with what's on TV. I can't help you with what's on at the movies. I can't help what your kids are watching on iPhones. I can't help uh, what your kids are streaming. Uh, on your television sets at home or, or, or many of the other challenges that we all face with teenage children. Uh, but to suggest that somehow this federal government is hostile uh, to faith and we must vote for Donald Trump to protect Christendom is one of the stupidest arguments I've ever heard in my life. Look what the Supreme Court has done on religious liberty, specifically protecting religious liberty of conservative Christians, people that I have grown up with and been with in churches for you know the past 57 years. The sense of victimhood is outrageous. You know what makes it even more outrageous? I'm sorry to get on this this, this uh, soapbox, is the lot of these same people that are talking about religious liberty are supporting a guy still who promoted a Muslim registry. Yes, yes, a Muslim registry. Sounds an awful lot like Jewish reg registries in Nazi Germany. Oh, you can't say those words, can you? Oh, but wait, that's what he proposed. And a lot of you evangelicals that run around mm. screaming about religious freedom and religious liberty and how, how the libs are coming after you and your church and your beliefs with, while you're ignoring Supreme Court decisions, one precedent after another, protecting your rights, which, of course, I support because I'm a conservative. You don't feel that way and you don't have those same concerns for the others and it's just the damnedest thing <laughs> you talk about pro-life you talk about protecting unborn babies you just don't care about babies that are born that are locked in cages oh you say oh with Barack Obama oh, he's... no it wasn't Barack Obama's policy to deliberately find children and lock them up but that was Donald Trump's policy in fact they had a cabinet meeting where everybody raised their hands to support it except for Christian Nielsen. Who got blamed for it. That was, <laughs> that was a stated policy. So I, I, I really don't get it. I mean, the victimhood, I mean, come on. Stop being a victim. Stop being a snowflake. I get the same, uh, uh, mo most likely, a lot of the same beliefs that you have. Uh, but those similarities stop when I think that the protection of my faith of my evangelical faith uh, should only be applied to me and not applied to Catholics, not applied to Jews, not applied to Muslims, not applied to the others. Mm -hmm. The blinders, I, I gotta say, after all these years, the blinders are, 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 are just extraordinary, Mika. I, I do wanna say one other thing, too. I mean, again, there are people, uh, now I'm gonna upset, upset maybe some people on the left. There are people who are acting like it's the end of the world because we may have divided government. I go back again to Thomas Ricks' book that's coming out in the next couple of weeks, where again, 
the separation of powers, this frustration that stops tyrants from taking over governments or stops parties from darting too far in one direction or the other direction, that is not a bug of our government. That is a feature. That is not a bug in the Constitution. That is a feature. Those of you talking about how we need to change the Constitution, you need to take a long, cold shower. Because checks and balances, that's what this government's about. And that's what scared me so much over the past four years of the Trump presidency. And by the way, we're not, the world's not coming to the, the end, okay? Yeah, I don't understand why people voted for Donald Trump. I don't. I don't understand why my family voted for Donald Trump. I don't understand why my best friends voted for Donald Trump. I don't understand why everybody in my neighborhood voted for Donald Trump. I don't understand why everybody that I know voted for Donald Trump. But I got to get along with them. I love them. I'm not going to throw away 57 years of friendships over one election. We got to stop thinking that it's the end, everything's the end of the world. Bill Clinton was the end of the world. George W. Bush, the end of the world. Barack Obama, the end of the world. Donald Trump, the end of the world. Joe Biden, it's going to be the end of the world. You're in good company. As Rick said in his book, George Washington died believing that the republic he built was doomed. Thomas Jefferson died believing the Declaration of Independence that helped launch the United States of America was doomed. They died pessimists believing their government and their nation was moving in the wrong direction. We're still here. And we'll survive four years or eight years of Donald Trump. We'll survive four years or eight years of Joe Biden. It's time for us to take a deep breath and just move forward with our lives and stop obsessing so much over politics. Now, let's continue with our three-hour show on <laughs> politics. Well, Mika. Thank you, Joe. Since uh, falsely declaring victory from the White House early Wednesday morning, President Trump has remained holed up inside his residence, watching the results. The New York Times reports that Trump made calls to supporters and friends yesterday while watching Fox News coverage, sounding subdued and somewhat dispirited to some people. He also spoke to the Republican governors of Texas and Florida to ask about the possibility that fraud was being committed, according to people briefed on the call. The president's advisors reportedly tried to persuade Trump to speak in the East Room before Joe Biden's remarks in the morning hours on Wednesday, but they were unsuccessful. Instead, they sat and watched as Biden set the tone for the night. As Arizona edges towards a Biden win, some Trump aides have begun pointing fingers. They told the Times that Trump had often resisted requests from his top advisors to spend more time in Arizona, in part because he did not like traveling west and spending the night on the road. While Trump was not seen publicly yesterday, he was tweeting, and his close circle was very vocal, including Eric Trump and Rudy Giuliani, who held a news conference in Pennsylvania to question the state's ballot counting methods. We're not showing any of that. Oh, though, right? it's something no, else. It's crazy. I don't want him to be embarrassed any more than he already it's, is. Uh, it was incredible. Yeah. Meanwhile, son-in-law Jared Kushner was making calls, looking for what he described as a, quote, James Baker-like figure. Too late for that. Who could lead the legal effort to dispute the tabulations in different states, according to a person briefed on the discussions. Let's bring in Peter All Baker. Right. Uh, so, Peter, uh, talk about what's going on inside the White House right now. Well, look, this is obviously a White House that has fewer paths toward victory than Joe Biden, as you guys have already now very aptly uh, outlined. And they're hanging on or clinging on to the idea that they're going to still pull it out, that they still have a couple ways of getting there. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a place where backbiting and, and uh, finger pointing is only going to increase in the hours and days to come, particularly uh, as some of these votes continue to be counted without, uh, you know, without giving them the victory that they think that they should have. And I think that, you know, any White House on the edge of a defeat, if this is where the, this White House ends up being, 
uh, is a pretty toxic place. And add to that a president whose very modus operandi, whose very method of, of operating is, in fact, to uh, cast blame, to, uh, to to drive division, and then you've got a much more uh, you know toxic stew than you would even normally have. Peter Baker, can I ask you about the James Baker comparison that that uh, Jared Kushner is fishing around looking for his his James Baker? Obviously, you've got a book out about it right now. The circumstances around Florida and James Baker obviously extraordinarily different than what we have in front of us right now. Yeah, they're significantly different. A couple of things. First of all, uh, James Baker, who uh, you know led George W. Bush's recount effort in Florida, didn't try to stop counting before the first count had even happened. That's right. what they're talking about doing. And second of all, he didn't throw around baseless allegations of fraud with absolutely zero evidence whatsoever. He would have considered that to be uh, embarrassing. That's certainly not what George, uh, James Baker was trying to do. And the difference in Florida is, look, they had a full count in Florida. The question then became that Democrats wanted four counties to go back and look at some of the ballots that had been thrown out for procedural reasons because they weren't fully punched through in the punch card uh, ballots, for instance, and they were trying to then get some of those ballots back into play. The Republicans under James Baker weren't trying to throw out whole categories of, 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 of ballots and massively because uh, they were going to go for the other team. It, it, it's a very different situation there. And the other difference I would say is that Jim Baker and the Democrats, they fought it out through the system. They fought all the way to the Supreme Court. In the end, obviously, Democrats were disappointed in the Supreme Court's decision. To this day, they're bitter about it. But in the end, you had an Al Gore and George W. Bush and Jim Baker, people who believed in the system, who didn't try to tear it mm -hmm. down, who didn't sit there and call the whole thing rigged and corrupt and uh, fraudulent without any basis whatsoever. They believed in the system. When it was over, Al Gore gave a very gracious concession speech in which he said, okay, now George W. Bush is our president. And George W. Bush gave a very gracious victory speech in which he said, I am now the president of Republicans and Democrats and all Americans. They tried to reach out and they believed in the system. And I don't think that's what we're seeing right now in this particular president. Absolutely not, Yamish. In fact, the president of the United States is just throwing baseless conspiracy theories against the wall, hoping something will stick. He's retweeting Breitbart. He's claiming victory in fundraising emails in the state of Pennsylvania, when obviously that's not true, as Dave Wasserman has been showing us. The Biden victory in the state of Pennsylvania looks like it could come sometime later today. So what is happening inside the White House right now? We've got these different arguments in different states from Pennsylvania to Arizona, stop the vote, count the vote. They're trying to get something to stick to the wall. Do they actually think something will change with these lawsuits which seem to be based in nothing at this point? The strategy now is to try to rustle back states, and they are hoping that this legal strategy um, helps the president win back some states that have been called by other networks, as well as the AP, um, including their, uh, Arizona as one of those states that the AP has put in its corner. I know NBC hasn't called it yet. The vote there is still very close. People are still counting in that state. But the president is flooding the zone with misinformation. His Twitter timeline right now looks like a collage of labels with Twitter warning people that most of the information um, the majority of the information that he's sent out in the last few hours, few days, is wrong, that it's not something that should be believed, that there's misinformation there, that he is calling states for himself. He's <clears throat> claiming Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia. We've never seen a U.S. president try to delegitimize a U.S. election. If this was happening in another country, we would be alarmed. We might be sending in election observers, sending in backup to help yeah. that country get their democracy in order. But it's happening here in the United States. And what the president's also doing is lashing out at people that were trying to get him to change his rhetoric on the coronavirus pandemic when he was downplaying it, trying to get him to change his rhetoric when he was attacking people like John McCain in the state of Arizona, of course, someone who was seen as a, a icon, a political figure in that state. Um, I'm already hearing from Trump advisors, people that are close to the president, uh, blaming in, in some ways, pointing fingers at each other. And that, you can see, is them starting to get deflated, starting to feel like this might not end well for them. There's still some hope, mm -hmm. but the president is lashing out and doing all of this because he's very, very worried that he might lose and the courts might be the only way they could get it back. So, Jeffrey Goldberg, we've always been wondering for years, actually, like, where's the line? Where is the line for Trump Republicans? Like, how far will they go for him? It seems like this might be it. We heard from leading Republicans yesterday from Maryland's 
Larry Hogan, we're here from Marco Rubio, uh, Chris Christie. Um, this is a no-go. This is not an area where they want to stand next to Donald Trump. Do you think that will continue? Um, you know, I think this is the this is a huge question. I you know the the I, I personify the question in in in, uh, in Mitch McConnell. You know, the the, the question yes. I have in my mind: When does Mitch McConnell simply call up the White House and say, "Okay, it's over." Just stop. Yeah. We're not we're not doing this anymore. I mean, at, but of course, you know, uh, one could hope that that would happen. But also, if you look back over the previous four years, um, there were approximately one million moments in which responsible Senate leadership could have called up the White House and said, "Please stop doing that. Please stop saying that. Please stop promoting conspiracy theories. Please stop being racist. Please stop uh, 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 a whole bunch of things." Um, so I don't have. You know, I, I don't think you can um, say with confidence that that's going to happen uh, immediately based on past performance. But if, when you see what Marco Rubio tweeted, when you see what Governor Hogan, admittedly a East Coast moderate, uh, uh, said, uh, you, you have to you have to wonder if the dam just breaks uh, today or very soon, and people somehow call up the president and say, reality has now uh, dictated that you're not going to be the president. Anymore. The the second question, of course, is what will Trump say when Mitch McConnell tells him that um, uh, this is over, uh, and and no one can truly predict that. Yeah. Hey, so let me ask you, Jeffrey, though, along the lines of these senators uh, who have uh, been uh, silent when uh, I think most Americans. Uh, that care about constitutional norms and political norms and the savings of lives, the saving of lives, would have wanted them to speak out. They remained silent. Uh, they were obsequious to Donald Trump, uh, but they were rewarded uh, this week at the polls. You look at Joni Ernst, uh, who really became unrecognizable as a politician from her campaign ads after Donald Trump was elected president. Uh, you can look at Susan Collins, who went against the wishes of her state uh, several times uh, had promoted her to herself as being a pro-choice Republican and then, uh, of course, supported Kavanaugh and also remained silent for the most part when Donald Trump breached constitutional and political norms. You can look at Tom Tillis in North Carolina. Steve Daines beat uh, very strong uh, Steve Bullock uh, in Montana. And uh, even if you look at what what's happening right now in Arizona, we were seeing polls that showed uh, that Mark, Martha McSally was losing by double digits. Here we are on Thursday, NBC News still not calling that race because it's still too close. So uh, it seems that at least for uh, many of these senators, uh, clinging on to Donald Trump and remaining silent uh, actually was a good political strategy for him, for him even if we found it repugnant. Right. You, you know, it's interesting. It's already become a cliche in, like, in two days um, to say that uh, Trump may have lost, but Trumpism uh, has has won. Um, and I think you can uh, examine that statement across a couple of different dimensions. The first is the Democrats have to ask themselves serious questions about centrism, about um, the way they, um, I think Mika was talking about this before, you know, and you've been talking about it, um, the way people feel that Democrats and liberals hector the, the, the rest of the country. And so there are a lot of questions about, about the Democrats being able to reach to the middle. There are other set of questions, too, that have to do with our information ecosystem and the fact that um, a competing television network, for instance, um, pushes mm -hmm. out information that is just not true and has penetrated deeply, deeply, deeply into the country. And so you've created a closed system in which these senators, who many of whom you, you know, you know, and, and, and you know think that Trump is all the things that you, Joe, might think Trump is, um, they know that that ecosystem, that information uh, architecture that we exist within uh, won't allow them to survive if they actually call out uh, what needs to be called out. I mean, I'm struck by one, just one other thought. I'm struck by something. Uh, I was struck this morning by thinking that um, that if Donald Trump had had a credible response to the pandemic, if he had taken on the pandemic the way one would, what a president would take on an enemy, and of course the virus is an enemy, um, 
you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation at all. You know, he, he'd have won 53, 54% of the popular vote. He'd be sweeping states that um, he's now losing. Um, and and this goes back to your question about why didn't anybody say anything? There are, there's going to be a, a lot of people who need to be held to account. Um, the people who knew better, um, they saw his disastrous handling of this pandemic, um, and they said nothing and they did nothing out of fear. And it was out of fear of of being called out by Trump, out of fear by being called out by the enormous media and social media apparatus behind Donald Trump. Um, so we're everybody has to be uh, held held to account for something. But I, I think these group of smart senators, especially, um, we're going to have to ask them, what were you thinking? Yeah. Um, all right. The Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg. We always love having you on. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, it, it, and Jeffrey's uh, comments reminded me of a conversation I had last night. Uh, and there are, um, of course, there are elected Republican officials, both governors and senators, who uh, are now breathing a sigh of relief, actually believing that Donald Trump is going to be leaving Washington, D.C. Of course, they would never admit that to their voters, uh, but have felt the burden of keeping their mouths shut or defending the indefensible. Uh, and um, I'm hearing from, from many of them uh, who, uh, who are actually looking forward to being able to be elected representatives for four years without having to run away from cameras to respond to the latest Donald Trump outrage. Dave Wasserman, let's go back to Georgia. It's a tough, uh, tough fight down there, a close race. Have you gotten any information where those remaining 25,000 ballots are from? Not yet, Joe. But we do believe that, th that they're mostly in, in Metro Atlanta. So if they're in Metro Atlanta, um, uh, let's see, uh, where it's an 18,000 vote difference right now. Uh, so Joe Biden would have to Joe Biden would have to pick up, uh, I guess, about eight and ten of those votes. So uh, when are we going to be uh, when when, are, when do you think we're going to be uh, hearing? I know there's going to be this morning, but when do you think we're going to be uh, hearing uh, more from Pennsylvania and and get a better idea of when Joe Biden uh, is going to go past Donald Trump in vote totals? Yeah, I think we'll be getting a better idea from Pennsylvania throughout the day. Keep in mind that if there are as many outstanding ballots in the city of Philadelphia as, uh, as we think there are, if Philadelphia's turnout was in line with similar cities around the country, uh, other, country uh, other counties in Pennsylvania, then Joe Biden could potentially erase uh, Trump's entire lead at the moment just from those uncounted Philadelphia votes. Now, there is some debate about exactly how many there are outstanding, and certainly the Trump campaign hopes that there, that, that falls on, on the lower end of the range. The problem for Trump is that there are also hugely Democratic batches of mail-in ballots that have, and that have yet to be added to the tallies uh, from some large counties, such as Delaware uh, uh, County, right outside of Philadelphia, uh, Lehigh County, which is Allentown, uh, Monroe County, Cumberland County, outside of Harrisburg, the West Shore suburbs. There's a lot of Democratic vote there in, in, that, uh, in those suburbs. So look, there are, there are a lot of, of uh, different pathways here for Biden to be able to erase the deficit in Pennsylvania and probably do so comfortably. All right, Dave Wasserman, thank you so much uh, for being on the show this morning. Willie. Dave, thanks so much. Let's bring in now Democratic Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin of Michigan, who defeated her Republican challenger to win re-election to Michigan's 8th Congressional District. Congresswoman, congratulations on your victory a couple of nights ago. Uh, it was close throughout. I know it was a fight for you all summer. What was the deciding issue here? It was a coronavirus. What was front and center as people went to the polls on Tuesday? I certainly think that the president's response to the coronavirus was a big deal for a lot of people. We had a pretty big swing in our district. President won the district in 2016 by over 25,000 votes and won it by under 2,000 this time around. So um, it's, I think that's a big part of it. And also health care. Um, just the idea that people with pre-existing conditions were at risk of completely losing their coverage 
really we started to get a lot of questions about that. So those, those two issues for sure. So Congresswoman, you were one of the people warning over the summer that Michigan as a state was much closer than polls were showing in terms of the presidential race, that it was going to be a dogfight. In fact, it has been here. Um, what did you see over the course of the summer that told you some of the polls, and we can talk about polls in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and other places, but in Michigan, exactly what were you seeing on the ground that showed you that the polls might not be right? Well, I mean, I think in general, we know from 2016 that we, we just didn't get it right, right? The folks who were doing the polling across the country were just undercounting Trump voters. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, some of which is just that they maybe they don't answer polls as much. Maybe they only come out to vote um, for President Trump when he is personally on the ballot. Maybe that's why we got it right in 2018 and not 2020. Um, but I, I think that fundamental undercounting from 2016 should have been like a bright, shiny, you know, flashing light uh, for 2020. And, you know, listen, even the best of us were watching those polls and saying, OK, maybe we feel more comfortable. And in the end, that was incorrect. We heard from the Trump campaign that's suing the Michigan Court of Claims in the Michigan Court of Claims to look at the uh, ballot counting in the presidential election. Do you see any merit to that lawsuit? They want more observers. They say they want more eyes on how the ballots are being counted in your state. You know, I don't have any special insight into the case other than, you know, the president seems to be launching these lawsuits in multiple states. In some states, he wants to stop the count. In other states, he wants to continue the count. Um, so it feels a bit like sour grapes. And I don't, I don't think anyone should be confused about what's happening. The president has telegraphed for six months that he was going to challenge the results of the election. He, he made it very clear. And on the basis of absentee voting um, and the count of that vote. So we shouldn't suddenly be shocked that he's doing what he said he would do for six straight months. Yeah, and the Office of the Attorney General in Michigan said there's access by members of both parties already uh, observers in place that there is no merit to this. Congresswoman Mike Barnacle is here with a question for you. Mike. Congresswoman, uh, given the trajectory, it looks as if we're going to have a, a Biden presidency, perhaps announced as soon as today, given the, the probability of Pennsylvania coming in. And given your background in the intelligence community, what do you think can be done almost immediately under a Biden presidency to improve not only the morale of the intelligence community, but the effectiveness of the intelligence community working with Congress and the president? Sure. Um, well, listen, the, the, the vice president and hopefully president is going to have a, a big task on his hands. I think the big thing to do, frankly, for the intelligence community, the same thing goes for the State Department and all the diplomats that we've lost, is there actually is a law on the books that allows the next director of the CIA or DNI, the next secretary of state, to do a targeted callback of folks who have departed. Um, and either they were pushed out or they resigned out of principle. Um, if we need their expertise, if we need their management, skills, if we need some of that senior experience, um, those senior officials can come in and bring them back. And I think that that would be important, particularly since we've lost a ton of mid-level professionals who just exited out because they couldn't deal with what they were being asked to, to you know, represent. So I think that would be on day one or two, a really big, important thing for the Biden administration to do. Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin, thank you so much uh, for being on this morning. Congratulations. Bread. Or beer. Or birthday cake. And even on a strict gluten-free diet, many of us still experience symptoms. Which is why we need more awareness, understanding, and research. For treatments and a cure. Learn more at beyondcelliac.org. No one plans on having an accident. That morning, it happened to me. After the fall, I had so many questions. I gotta call the Barnes firm. And that was the best call I could have made. Welcome back. It's 48 past the hour. The sun has come up over a Washington, D.C. Still waiting to see who will be the next president of the United States. Let's go to Peter Baker. Um, Peter, as things sort of close in on the president, the numbers not looking good, fair to just speaking fact here. Um, you're envisioning a little bit of what Trump does after, where Trump goes from here. Um, is there a Trump legacy? And what about the people who work for Trump? 
Yeah, it's a great question. I think that we think that uh, President Trump isn't going to go anywhere quietly. I think that's a fair question, a fair point to make. I've Even if he is, uh, yeah. you know, Right. Yeah. Even if he's packing the moving truck on January 20th, he's still got 88 million Twitter followers. He's talking about whether he might set up his own television network to sort of compete with Fox News on the right, whether he might even run again. He's talked in private, at least with some of his advisors, sometimes jokingly, sometimes not, that maybe he would announce that he's running again in 2024. Uh, that might just be a way of raising funds so he can continue to do rallies. But I think one thing you can count on is that he's not going to simply go away quietly. This is somebody who's not going to suddenly become Jimmy Carter running off to fight guinea worm in Africa or George H.W. Bush, uh, you know, quietly ret you know, retiring to Texas. This is, this is a president who, if defeated, would he would be the first incumbent president defeated in 28 years, if he is, uh, doesn't plan to, to, to leave uh, without much of a, uh, uh, a mark. And I think that the election results give him more credibility in that sense. He, he proved more resilient than a lot of people had expected, right? He got, so far, 68 million votes. That's 5 million more votes than he got four years around. So rather than losing, uh, you know, in the aggregate, he still got 48% of the public standing by him. That gives him power within a Republican Party that has he has dominated for the last four or five years, particularly if the Republicans remain in charge in the Senate. And he's goosing them on from the sidelines, telling him to stand up to, to a President Biden if he were, in fact, to, to win the White House. Dimitri, the president obviously is not thinking about the future yet. He's trying to scrape his way somehow, improbably, to a win here. Uh, Jeffrey Goldberg was talking in our last segment about Mitch McConnell or someone else going to the president and saying, Mr. President, we have to respect the outcome. It's time to go. Uh, does that person exist? I mean, I'm racking my brain to think of who has the clout to walk into President Trump's office the way Barry Goldwater did in the summer of 74 and tell Richard Nixon it was time to go. Who would he possibly listen to that? I mean, he's just going to continue to retweet conspiracy theories, it seems, till the end. Well, the president um, has a lot of people around him who might say that to him. Whether or not the president will actually heed that is another story. I think there are still a couple of people in the White House who deliver hard news to the president, who tell him things that he doesn't want to hear, including people who were trying to, at one point, convince him to come out and speak before Joe Biden, trying to convince him to come out and be a little bit more subdued, trying not to sit, tell him to declare victory early. Of course, he doesn't listen a lot of times to those people. He has not listened. Um, when it came to the coronavirus and his rhetoric there and all sorts of other subjects. So I think we'll have to wait and see um, if there are Republicans who will actually be able to convince him to come out. What we do know is that we already see Senate Republicans doing something that they rarely, rarely do, and that is um, having a message that is different from President Trump. We saw Marco Rubio coming out saying voter suppression is not mm -hmm. counting the votes. That alone, even though it shouldn't be a controversial um, statement, is seen as brave on the part of Republicans because they, they have been so um, rarely wanting to, to try to have any sort of message that conflicts with the president. Um, but if the president loses, um, you're going to start seeing Republicans, of course, looking at their party and looking ahead. You already see Democrats, I should say, um, sounding excited at, at the idea of Joe Biden winning, but already envisioning Mitch McConnell doing what Mitch McConnell has been doing um, for years now, and that is getting in the way of Democrats, even if they win the White House. So I've already been talking to sources who say the legislative um, move forward, though. How, bills that, that Joe Biden might want to get passed, they're going to get held up in this Republican Senate, and it's going to be a dogfight. Or, uh, I mean, there is, in theory, a chance that the Dems could win a majority uh, if they win both of the Georgia runoffs or one of them and Alaska. Um, so we're still waiting on, on those. We shall see. Mike Barnacle? Peter Baker, uh, it's kind of interesting that one of the items on the national agenda right now that we deal with every day, the virus, if Donald Trump had dealt with it, he might be in an entirely different position electorally today, but he's not. And it certainly appears, oh, Yamish, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I guess Peter's AWOL. But so let me ask you, because you, you I mean, you're, you're, hooked in, you're hooked into the White House. Uh, so if he had dealt with the virus, he would be in an entirely different position today. And yet he didn't, and he's not. And probably Pennsylvania comes in, it looks like, and Joe Biden will be president-elect. Can you, given your understanding 
of Donald Trump and the people around him, the mood, the tenor of this administration, and the man himself, could you ever envision him giving a concession speech? Hmm. It's hard to envision the president, frankly, doing that. Um, I'm sure it might look something, if, if it happens, it might look something like when he said that birtherism wasn't true, that Barack Obama was born in this country. It was quick. It was fast. You almost missed it if you didn't pay attention. So we could possibly see that um, happening. I will say that I've been talking to advisors who have been saying to me all morning, um, we try to get President Trump to say something differently on the coronavirus. We try to get him not to downplay this virus. He did not listen. He leaned into his instincts. He took that risk not listening to Republicans. Um, and that is, of course, where we now see him landing. Um, so it's it's hard to envision, but it's... The Shark, That Mom. For nearly a decade, Comcast has been helping students get ready. We've connected 4 million low-income students to low-cost, high-speed Xfinity internet. We're working with hundreds of school districts across the country to sponsor free internet and laptops. And parents are seeing an impact. And now we're turning 1,000 community centers into lift zones, Wi-Fi enabled safe spaces to study, so more students can be ready for anything. I'll try to do some homework here. These days, your couch may be getting more mileage than your wheels, but that doesn't mean you can't plan for your next adventure or how you'll get there. Bring the best new models straight to your big screen with the X1 Auto Showroom. Just say Auto Showroom into your X1 voice remote or go to channel 889, 891, or 989. In the X1 Auto Showroom, you can scroll through participating manufacturers, see all the latest videos of your favorite vehicles, and maybe even how they handle. When the open road starts calling again, what will you be driving? Find it on the X1 Auto Showroom, powered by Effective. It's clear that we're winning enough states to reach 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency. When the count is finished, we believe we will be the winners. Joe Biden sounding optimistic two days after Election Day and the election is still undecided. Biden currently leads 253 electoral votes to Donald Trump's 214. Biden expanded his lead yesterday after winning Michigan's 16 electoral votes, Wisconsin's 10, and three of Maine's four, Trump won the other. We're still awaiting results from several battleground states. Right now, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Nevada, North Carolina, all too close to call. Arizona, too early to call. So here we are. Good morning and welcome to Morning Joe. It is Thursday, November 5th. Along with Joe, Willie and me, we have White House reporter for the Associated Press, Jonathan Lemire. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent and host of Way Too Early, Casey Hunt. We will never let her stop working. <laughs> and host of MSNBC's Politics Nation and president of the National Action Network, Reverend Al Sharpton is with us. So first to Pennsylvania. Let's go right there. Joe Biden has cut into Donald Trump's lead significantly. Around this time yesterday, Trump led by some 700,000 votes. Now with 89% of the expected vote in, Trump now leads by just over 164,000 votes, with a lot of mail-in ballots still being counted. We could look specifically at Philadelphia County, home to a lot of Biden voters. He currently leads by 60 percent, and we are still waiting for more than 244,000 votes from Philadelphia County. Biden is currently at 79 percent. <throat> Hillary Clinton won Philadelphia County with 82 percent in 2016. We're also waiting for about 80,000 votes from Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh is located. Biden currently leads by 19 percentage points in that county. And over in Bucks County, the state's fourth most populated county, where unemployment rates and deaths per capita linked to COVID are some of the highest in the country. Trump currently leads by just over 3,200 votes, with 58,000 votes still expected. Trump lost Bucks County by less than one percentage point back in 2016. And while we're uh, talking about, uh, about uh Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and state of Pennsylvania, Willie. Uh, let's just, if, if we look at some of the numbers that I just uh, had sent to me, 
Uh, big difference in 16. In Montgomery County, Biden's up by 26. Uh, that's up from 21 uh, several, uh, four years ago. In Chester, he's up by 17. That's up uh, about for Hillary Clinton's 9%. Delaware by 23. That's also up. And uh, Bucks will uh, end up likely being a wider margin uh, than 16. But, but Pennsylvania is one of those states that if you look at the trends and you see where it's going, and uh, it's been going th that way for the past couple of days, uh, it looks like that's a state where Joe Biden's going to catch up in much the same way he caught up in Wisconsin and Michigan. If, again, as I keep saying, the past is prologue, it looks like he's going to have enough votes, uh, which he's getting at, at a quick enough, enough clip uh, that he could catch up. Georgia's a little tighter. Mm -hmm. Georgia, we're going to go down, I mean, that's, we're going to go down to the last 10,000 votes there. Uh, Biden can uh, catch up there, most likely uh, will get very close, if not uh, go ahead by five, 10,000 votes. Uh, but then you look at Arizona, uh, that's actually going in an opposite direction. Uh, and it's Donald Trump who's picking up votes at a pretty good clip. They still have quite a few to count there. And uh, the, the votes that are coming in in Arizona, we're looking, of course, at Pennsylvania right now, but the votes that are coming in in Arizona are ballots that were dropped off at the end. Uh, and if Arizona is anything like Florida, as far as uh, the waves of voters, uh, the closer to the election uh, those ballots are dropped off, those absentee ballots are dropped off, uh, the more likely voters are uh, to be voting for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And certainly in a batch that was released last night, we saw an almost 60-40 split uh, in favor of Donald Trump, and the president's going to need to continue on that pace. Uh, again, uh, I think Steve Kornacki said he's going to have to pick up 59 percent of all votes uh, that remain in Arizona to uh, overtake Joe Biden. So that's yeah. going to be a close one. Yeah. And then, of course, Nevada later on today, which the Biden camp feels extremely confident about. They feel extremely confident about that. Arizona still confident from the Biden camp, but you're right, as those come in, they get a little bit less confident. Arizona is still too early to call. Right now, Joe Biden leading President Trump, as you said, by about 68,000 votes, still waiting for votes from all important Maricopa County. The election department for Maricopa, which is Arizona's most populous county, tweeted overnight about 275,000 ballots still to be counted, plus provisionals, adding more results will come at 7 p.m. local time today. Not clear when other counties in Arizona will report out their latest figures. But Jonathan Lemire, this is a place, as you know, that the Trump campaign in the White House is focusing very closely, the state of Arizona. We've seen some of his supporters out chanting, count the votes, count the votes there. Obviously, in other states, they're saying, stop the count, stop the count. So they should make up their mind about whether or not they want <laughs> the that? votes to be counted. <laughs> but Jonathan, <laughs> how, um, how close does the White House think Arizona is? It may not matter if Joe Biden wins Pennsylvania today he's got enough to go over 270 so where is the White House focus this morning the White House's focus is sort of in the closing days of the campaign is pretty scattershot so a lot of places at once but you certainly hit the two states that they're most zeroed in on right now Arizona to start and we should note uh, the Associated Press uh, and Fox News have already called Arizona uh, for for Joe Biden and that's something that has enraged uh, the Trump campaign we they, we have they've spoken publicly about it um, there's been, we have reported that the night on election night when Arizona uh, first went was Fox News made that first call that that set a chill through the president's watch party in the East Room of the White House. Um, that is one, as you said, that they believe that they can pick up the number of votes um, needed to flip it. And certainly it's where they're trying to contest this election right now. Uh, they feel that, uh, that they have the ability to change this, even as the votes come in from Maricopa County. Uh, but it should be noted, there's been also a lot of second guessing in Trump world about Arizona. That's a state that loomed for a while now as a problem. And some members of the campaign, including Brad Parscale, who, of course, uh, was demoted over the summer, uh, back in the early days of 2020, suggested the president needed to spend more time there. They saw some early warning signs uh, there. And the president was reluctant to do so, in part because uh, he didn't like traveling out west. He is so reluctant to spend any nights away from his own bed uh, that he didn't want to be out there, which would require an overnight stay. Uh, the other focus is Pennsylvania. And the math here is obvious. They feel they need Arizona and Pennsylvania in order to keep any sort 
sort of feasible legal challenge going to have to show that they still have a possible path to 270. Uh, Pennsylvania, the, their campaign, campaign manager Bill Stepien, declared victory in Pennsylvania. On a conference call with reporters, he declared victory. We all know that's not how this works. Uh, but he did that. His, the Trump campaign had a news conference in Philadelphia that featured Rudy Giuliani, among others. They made that same claim. Uh, they believe they have enough votes to squeak out a victory there, but they acknowledge they're growing more pessimistic by the hour uh, as the numbers come in, that Pennsylvania will be very, very difficult. And as a final point, you're right. We're seeing sort of an incoherence in their legal challenges right now. There are three states, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Michigan, where they're trying to stop the count. In Arizona, they're trying to keep it going. And it shows right now just a real fear uh, that, in, in, that today uh, this race is slipping away from the president. Well, and there is a legal incoherence, Mika, and you, you saw it. Republicans, there are no Republicans taking, uh, That's right. taking these challenges seriously. Mitch McConnell, as well as uh, other senators, have, step, Maryland's governor. have stepped forward. Of course, yeah, Larry Hogan in Maryland have stepped forward and uh, you, you had Rick Santorum uh, on CNN, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Christie when he was on ABC. A lot of the president's steadfast resoundingly report, reporters. Resoundingly pushing back. Yeah, resoundingly pushing back for good reason because <laughs> they understand the consequences of undermining the rule of law. Uh, the, well, president, uh, the president does not understand the consequences of undermining the rule of law, and he's made that perfectly clear over the past four five years, or some would say over the course of his entire adult life. But in this case, uh, the fact that he's having such a scattershot approach uh, where he's demanding the stopping of counting in states where he's uh, ahead mm -hmm. uh, are, are, in Michi the case of Michigan, uh, falling behind further by the, the hour, uh, and then demanding the counting of votes of states where he's behind, that has legal consequences. When federal judges see that sort of scattershot approach, that sort of uh, intellectually uh, incoherent uh, uh, legal argument, uh, then that does have legal consequences uh, for those challenges. That's why uh, I, I don't think anybody that I've spoken with uh, in, in the legal community sees any merit to any of these claims. So we are we are a far, uh, far stretch uh, from uh, the legal challenges of 2000. Uh, right now, there don't appear to be any that are going to be significant. Yeah, I mean, someday it'd be great to talk to some of these gentlemen and ask them what made this different <laughs> than other things that they have stood by quietly. But uh, a resounding pushback to the president's efforts and, and members of his family, the president's family, were holding little press conferences around the country, screaming accusations of voter fraud right and left. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, it was, it was kind of interesting and, and well, it's not sad inter it's, sa it's sad and pathetic. It I was mean, weird. <laughs> yeah, it was they're, sad. They're Bush League amateurs. Very, they've always showed. They've always been Bush League amateurs, and they yeah. stumbled they stumbled into the White House through uh, what Donald Trump, the remarkable campaign he was able to run in 2016. Well, no and matter right what now, you think of it, yep. Well, it was an incredible campaign. It was. It was. I, I, nobody expected him to win, uh, and it was the, I, probably the greatest upset. For us to change it. With I never planned on being in an accident, but that truck didn't stop. The truck accident left me with so many questions. I gotta call the Barnes firm. That was the best call I could have made. I've pricked my finger 3,000 times. My A1C was still over nine. Then I got the Dexcom G6. I just glance at my phone and there's my glucose number. Yes. I feel like I'm calling the shots, not my diabetes. Staying at home means being online more than ever. Use NordVPN to protect yourself from cyber threats. Get the app today and work from home safely. NordVPN, online security for your private and business life. No one ever plans on being in an accident, but that car ran the light. And my accident left me with so many questions. I gotta call the Barnes firm. That was the best call I could have made. So let's get back to the states here. Georgia is too close to call this morning. 
a new batch of votes just came in, and President Trump, his lead, has narrowed to just over 18,000 votes in Fulton County. That's home to Atlanta. There, at least 7,500 absentee votes still to be counted. At 10.15 p.m. last night, Georgia's Secretary of State said several counties were still counting ballots, and there were about 90,000 ballots still outstanding, numbers that will certainly update with this latest batch of votes. Well, so today you, could be a big day, Joe. Yeah, to, well, today is going to be a big day. And uh, so, Rev, we can put these states in different buckets. Philadelphia right now, again, if you just follow the trends of Wisconsin and, and Michigan, it certainly looks like Donald Trump is going to catch, uh, or Joe Biden's going to catch and overtake Joe Biden there. You look at Arizona, well, <clears throat> you know, uh, Donald Trump, I think is going to continue getting closer and closer uh, to Joe Biden it, as as they count those remaining votes. But in Georgia, we're at a virtual tie already. The new batch of votes put Donald Trump within 17,000 votes. You do the math, it looks like Joe Biden probably is going to catch him this morning and go ahead by 10,000, 20,000 votes. That is the way it appears at this point, uh, uh, very much so. I think the thing that comes to me, uh, you and I are Baptists, the preacher in me looks at the fact that Donald Trump probably personifies the most racist, xenophobic, sexist administration we've seen in our lifetime. And it may end up uh, just as Jim Clyburn and blacks in South Carolina brought Joe Biden into victory in the nominating process. It may be black districts in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and Fulton County in Georgia that brings them over the top in the Electoral College, which would be a fitting way uh, for us to uh, end the Trump administration. The president's me. You're supposed to I have type 2 diabetes. I've pricked my finger too many times. My A1C was still over 9. Then I got the Dexcom G6. I just glance at my phone and there's my glucose number. No finger sticks, none. Yes. Holy cow. My diabetes is no longer a mystery. My A1C's dropped over two points to 7.2. That's a huge victory. I feel like I'm calling the shots, not my diabetes. Many of us have herpes and managing outbreaks can be stressful. Between late night searches, finding an appointment, and waiting in line at the pharmacy, it's become a huge pain. Meet Nurex, the easiest way to manage herpes. After an online medical consultation, Nurex will ship your medication for free in discreet packaging. Nurex is available with or without health insurance. And you'll have a year of unlimited access to the Nurex medical team. Take charge of your outbreaks from home with Nurex. Go to Nurex.com to get started. Republicans on Capitol Hill are increasingly confident about their chances of holding a slim majority in the Senate. Right now, the GOP has 48 seats compared to Democrats' 47. <laughs> there are still five races that haven't been called. North Carolina is too close to call this morning. Wow. Yeah. In Georgia, one race is too close to call and the other is heading to a runoff. Arizona Senate race is also too early to call, although Mark Kelly has declared victory. Alaska is also too early to call. Yesterday, Democratic Senator Gary Peters was able to hold on to a seat in Michigan. And in Maine, Republican Senator Susan Collins was declared the apparent winner of her race. Casey Hunt, what races are standing out to you? Which ones that are too close or too early are you watching and why? Well, let's also, I just want to take a beat. I mean, Susan Collins, people I know. wrote her off for dead. I know. And, I, you know, honestly, I never did. And I hope if, you know, if you spin through the tape of, of what we've said about her on this show, I, I, she was always the one that we thought would be able to stand on her own apart from President Trump. And Joe Biden won the state mm -hmm. of Maine and Susan Collins uh, carried the state uh, for herself. So, uh, you know, that, that, is, that is remarkable. Uh, but setting that aside, I mean, we've really got a couple is. things going on here. Um, one, uh, in, on, on the governing question, I mean, it's clear that this, this is a split decision in terms, uh, or at least it's becoming clear, I should say. I want to be a little bit more careful since we haven't called the presidential 
presidential race or the Senate. But the trend lines are emerging that we are headed for uh, what's likely to be divided government. I mean, even if, if Democrats were to improbably take the Senate, it would be so, so narrow. This is not the sweeping victory that Democrats anticipated, a, a broad mandate to institute sweeping changes in policy. This is going to be a story likely about Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell and what their relationship is like. But to stick with the campaign for a second, uh, you know, the, we are watching Georgia. And I've been obsessed with Georgia for the last week of the campaign. And it's really bearing out in these two Senate races. We know one's going to a runoff. But all of my sources, both sides of the aisle, saying we really don't know how Georgia is going to come out here. It is so, so close at the presidential level. And the question is, is that other Senate race going to go to a runoff or not? Is one of those uh, candidates going to to get over 50 percent, which is what it would take. I think you could see one or the other ask for a recount to try and adjust that 50 percent number to try to avoid or to push the race into a runoff. So that's something to keep an eye on. But but there is a possibility if we have two runoffs that the majority could be on the line in Georgia in those runoffs uh, in in the first week of January of 2020. That's going to mean millions of dollars spent. We're all going to know all the names of all the counties uh, in Georgia. We're going to be talking about uh, those Buckhead moms in, in Cobb County that mm -hmm. that Joe was focused on uh, before Election Day. Uh, but, but Democrats, uh, potent, you know, have a, a, a lot at stake in this Purdue Ossoff outcome uh, in that Senate race because they they need both of these seats if they uh, want to hit uh, 50 in the Senate. Most likely, we're still waiting for uh, some some numbers out of Alaska, but a lot on the line in Georgia, Mika. And Casey, I'm just looking at these latest numbers out of Georgia. I mean, they're teetering. Purdue is right on that 50 percent line, so we'll see if he gets it gets above 50 to avoid the runoff. But to your question about governing, let's say for arguments. Joe Biden does find another state today and does get to 270. He does become the next president of the United States. Let's say, for argument's sake, you do have a Republican Senate. Um, what do the next four years look like? Divided government uh, back in Washington. Does anything get done? Mitch McConnell's already talking about a big uh, relief package that he wants to get done before the swearing in of the next president. What does government look like in Washington the next four years? Well, Willie, I, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of gridlock. I mean, we have seen a lot of, um, you know, it's been it's been a really challenging four years, incredibly partisan. Congress has tried to do big. I mean, how many times have we talked about an infrastructure package that, you know, yeah. both sides seem to to agree on, but that they fast. And because it's a ninja foodie, it can do things no other oven can, like flip away. The Ninja Foodie Air Fry Oven, the oven that crisps and flips away. All Star Kitchen has done it again with Vasta, the two-in-one kitchen wonder that creates veggie sheets and pasta out of regular fruits and vegetables. Look, place in a cucumber and spin. In no time, you'll have perfectly sliced sheets. Now add tuna, peppers, and cilantro for a delicious meal. Add the fettuccine blade and create homemade pasta, perfect for pad thai and chicken soup. Or spin your favorite fruits for snacks and desserts. The two-in-one Vasta is available at GetVasta.com and a retailer near you. Fall hard for fall TV. Here we go! Get pumped to see old friends. We are going to have so much fun. And make some new ones. We need each other. You're my person. I just got chills and the air multiplying. Okay. That's good. Add these fall shows to your list and get the season started. Just say, show me fall TV into your Xfinity voice remote. At one time or another, all of us had wished we had more money. If you have a short-term need for cash, come see me, Jacob. Or me, Al. At Numis International. The loan is based on jewelry or precious metals, which we hold in collateral until the loan is repaid. It's fast, easy, and costs a small fraction of some of those other loans. Plus, it's regulated by the state of California. If you want the best loan you can get, call us. Numis International. Since 1963, we must be doing something right. He is so cute. <laughs> long night of counting, it's clear that we're winning enough states to reach 270 electoral votes needed to win the presidency. I'm not here to declare that we've won, but I am here to report when the count is finished, we believe we will be the winners. There will be no blue states and red states when we win, just the United States of America. Once this election is finalized, and behind us. It'll be time for us to do what we've always done as Americans, to put the harsh rhetoric 
of the campaign behind us, to lower the temperature, to see each other again, to listen to one another, to, e to hear each other again, and respect and care for one another, to unite, to heal, to come together as a nation. So let me be clear. I, we are campaigning as a Democrat, but I will govern as an American president. The, pres the presidency itself is not a partisan institution. It's the one office in this nation that represents everyone. And it demands a duty of care for all Americans. And that is precisely what I will do. I will, I will work as hard for those who didn't vote for me as I will for those who did vote for me. Joe Biden speaking yesterday in Delaware with that message of how he will govern if he wins the presidency. He currently leads in the Electoral College count, 253 to Donald Trump's 214. Still to be called are Georgia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Arizona, and Nevada, which is where we find MSNBC correspondent Jacob Soboroff and editor of the Nevada Independent, John Ralston. Right now, Joe Biden is ahead in Nevada by about 7,600 votes, with thousands of ballots still uncounted as of yesterday. Jacob, we'll start with you. What do we know at this point of the timing for those ballots to be counted? You said it, Mika. It is incredibly, incredibly close here. And uh, to be honest with you, it's relatively quiet when it comes to ballots being counted here at the Clark County Election <laughs> Center. Uh, the first poll workers uh, and election observers are just starting to show up for this morning. And actually, I kid you not, a nice woman came up to me named Donna. She said she was a Morning Joe viewer. She was very excited to see us out here. She won't be watching the show this morning, but she will be conducting, I think, what is, in all seriousness, arguably one of the most important roles any citizen can play right now, and that is a observing the counting of the ballots here. Six electoral votes, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say, John Ralston would probably tell you this too, are very well gonna come out of this facility behind me. They have been counting for days. They have been counting deliberately. I wouldn't say slowly, but they have been counting very deliberately here where they count about 70,000 votes a day. And that doesn't necessarily mean we are going to know the results uh, today here uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada. The vast majority of the votes, potentially tens of thousands, if not more than that, uh, votes are outstanding here. And we'll get an update around 10 o'clock local time, 1 o'clock on the East Coast, um, about where that vote count stands and what happened with that 8,000 vote margin. Um, but as of right now, it stands at 8,000. They went home for the evening. We're 50 ununited states uh, of America when it comes to voting rules and regulations. And while we have seen some overnight <laughs> counts, even in other parts of this state, that wasn't the case here uh, last night, Mika. So John Ralston, the spread, as Jacob says, about 8,000, 7,600 votes, an advantage for Joe Biden. Where do you see the outstanding vote here? Could that lead grow for Joe Biden? Or on the other hand, could Donald Trump cut into that lead and perhaps overtake Joe Biden based on what's out? Well, well all we can do is uh, speculate, but we can do it in an educated way since we know that most of the votes are in Clark County, which is Las Vegas, which is uh, very heavily Democratic. And we know that uh, these are mail ballots. Uh, we re usually don't use a lot of mail ballots in Nevada, but there have been hundreds of thousands of mail ballots returned this time because of the pandemic and because they changed the law to mandate that every voter got a mail ballot. Uh, before Election Day, Democrats in Clark County had won those mail ballots by an overwhelming margin, more than two to one. So Democrats here are very optimistic when, as Jacob pointed out, these tens of thousands of ballots start to be counted that, that Joe Biden is going to pull away. There are some ballots still outstanding in the rural counties of Nevada, where, where uh, like most places in rural America, Donald Trump uh, did very well. But let me go, go really quickly, Willie, to a point that, that uh, Jacob made. Uh, they may not count or release all of these ballots this morning when they start to release them. Uh, and that means that, for instance, if they only released 15,000 of them, Joe Biden may pick up 
uh, some some ground, but that may be negated if, if uh, a few thousand votes are released from rural Nevada. We just uh, don't know. So for Democrats who just want, 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 want to see this be over with, they want Nevada to be in the blue column, uh, they may be disappointed this morning, depending on how many ballots they release. Yeah, Jacob, there are a lot of jittery Democrats across the country watching Nevada, so I'll ask you what's on their minds, a very sophisticated procedural question. What's taking so long? <laughs> Uh, this is just the way that they do it here, Willie. And what I would tell everybody is to buckle your seatbelts. I think election administrators are some of the most admirable people in this nation and some of the most important civil servants, no more so uh, than today and every four years. Um, but the process here is its own unique process. The 16th of November is the official certification date. If you move backwards from there, the 12th of November is the last day that signatures can be challenged on ballots. Backwards from there, the 10th of this month is the day that the last mail-in ballots can be counted as long as they were postmarked um, by the third. John said it. He said it exactly right. This is the first time ever on such a large scale we have had mail-in ballots in this state. Universal mail-in ballots, obviously, because of the same reason I'm wearing the mask, the coronavirus. And so while the Democrats are jittery, while they're wondering what's taking so long, I think that the simple answer is this is a deliberate effort by professional election administrators to get it right. That's right. And they're doing a good job under the rules they have and the volume of ballots that they've got coming in. So, John Ralston, let's take a step back and look at how people voted from what we know so far in the state of Nevada. What was top of mind as you look at some of the exit polling and people you talked to even before Election Day? Was it the economy? Was it coronavirus? Was it some combination of the two? Because as we know, those are inseparable at this point. What's going on in Nevada? They are inseparable, and those are the two overwhelming issues. Uh, uh, Nevada's been hit disproportionately, I think, to almost any other state uh, on, uh, on on the economy because of the coronavirus. Uh, and that's because, as, as I've been saying, uh, Willie, listen, uh, our economy is based on a few miles of road called the Las Vegas Strip. Mm -hmm. And when that shut down, that destroyed uh, the economy here in Nevada, cost tens of thousands of people their jobs, cost an unemployment uh, insurance uh, and claims nightmare that this state has never seen. And so the question for the Republicans who were trying uh, to win Nevada, which is a Democratic state, uh, is, is to try to substitute the Democratic governor, Steve Sisolak, for Joe Biden on the ballot and get them to blame the governor for shutting down the state for shutting down the economy as they portrayed it. It appears, since Joe Biden has not done as well in Clark County, at least until some of these ballots are counted as Hillary Clinton did, that that may have had uh, some impact, that they may not have blamed the president as much as the Democrats uh, would have wanted. And that's why, why this race is closer than, than, than I and a lot of other people thought it might be. All right, John Ralston and Jacob Soboroff, thank you both very much for being on this morning. Now, neighboring Arizona is still too early to call. We are waiting for votes from Maricopa County that are supposed to come in later tonight. Yesterday, protesters gathered at the Maricopa County Tabulation and Election Center, apparently angry that Joe Biden led Donald Trump in the votes counted in their state so far, and alleging voting issues contributed to the, his lead. At least 150 protesters, some of them armed, gathered yesterday evening at times yelling, count those votes, and sh chanting, shame on Fox of reference to the network calling the state for Joe Biden on Tuesday night. Some argued the use of Sharpie pens in validated ballots, a claim election officials say is completely false. At least a dozen county sheriff's office deputies were on the scene standing guard to the entrance in the building. Maricopa County has not voted for a Democrat for president since 1948. Well, hey. And Mika, all this now for the first time against the backdrop of a pandemic. The number of new United States mm. infections has surpassed 100,000 cases in a single day. No signs of slowing. Hospitalization numbers surging across the... And for a range of tax scenarios. And how do you have the resources to do that? We don't. That's why we brought in BDO. People who know, know BDO. It's my 912 No Days Off Migraine Medicine. It's Ubrelvi for any time, anywhere migraine strikes without worrying if it's too late or where I am. One dose can quickly stop migraine in its tracks within two hours. 
Unlike older medicines, Ubrelvi is a pill that directly blocks CGRP protein, believed to be a cause of migraine. Do not take with strong CYP3A4 inhibitors. Most common side effects were nausea and tiredness. Ask about Ubrelvi, the anytime, anywhere migraine medicine. Still your best friend, and now your co-pilot. Still a father, but now a friend. Still an electric car, just more electrifying. Still a night out, but everything fits in. Still hard work, just a little easier. Still a legend, just more legendary. Chevrolet, making life's journey just better. One of my favorite supplements is Cunol Turmeric. Turmeric helps with healthy joints and inflammation support. Unlike regular turmeric supplements, Cunol Superior Absorption helps me get the full benefits of turmeric. Cunol is the turmeric brand I trust. With the Ninja Foodie Power Pitcher, you can crush ice, make smoothies, and do even more. Chop salsas, spoon thick smoothie bowls, even power through dough, and never stall. The Ninja Foodie Power Pitcher. Rethink what a blender can do. Welcome back. 48 past the hour, a beautiful day in Washington, D.C. Whatever comes out of this election, one of the most important takeaways is that the polling was off once again, underestimating the strength of President Trump. NBC News White House correspondent Peter Alexander has more. It feels like deja vu all over again. Another rough night for pollsters fueling renewed doubts about political polls. We're headed for a polling reckoning in the months and years ahead. The president today complaining the pollsters got it completely and historically wrong. It's not the first time they missed the mark in President Trump's historic upset over Hillary Clinton four years ago. Once again, the stunner, some of the state polls. Take Wisconsin. Heading into Election Day, Biden was enjoying a nearly seven-point advantage on average over the president, with one recent poll showing him cruising by 17 points. But it appears Biden will eke it out in the state by less than 1%. So close, the Trump campaign is requesting a recount. Democrats thought Florida might turn blue with Biden and former President Barack Obama recently heading south, where the final polls showed Biden clinging to a tight lead. But President Trump would carry that state by more than three points. As much as we thought pollsters learned their lessons from 2016, it's clear that they haven't fully figured out how to accurately sample the Midwest, Florida, and other parts of the country as well. Pollsters had made changes promising not to underestimate Trump's support, including calling enough white voters without college degrees and rural voters. So what happened? There is some evidence that people who distrust institutions both support Trump more and respond to surveys less. Still, the polls did get some things right, forecasting the president would overperform among black men and Latinos. The takeaway? The only poll that matters is the one after every ballot is counted. All right, joining us now, Matt Barreto. He's co-founder of Latino Decisions, the leading national polling and research firm among Latino Americans. He's also a pollster for the Biden campaign. Also with us, former senior advisor for the House Oversight Committee, Kurt Bardella. He's a senior advisor for the Lincoln Project. By the way, we have a new categorization for the state of Arizona at this hour. Uh, it is now too close to call. Uh, so there we go as we wait for the numbers to come in. Matt, uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about Latino voters and um, Texas and Florida and what happened. Well, I think, you know, coming out of that uh, segment, if you look at the polling, uh, our polling found that it was going to be tight in these places and that the uh -huh. Latino vote was going to be decisive. And so if you look at places like Florida, let's start there. You know, let's not generalize, number one, from Miami-Dade County. It's only one county out of 3,000 counties across America. And the Latino vote overall uh, was a good night for Vice President Biden. Vice President Biden won the Latino vote. Uh, there had been some changes over the last few years, but he won the Latino vote overwhelmingly, uh, close to 70 percent. And so that is going to prove uh, decisive in states like Arizona that you were just talking about. That's a very close uh, margin. That's going to be the Latino vote that uh, makes a difference there in states like uh, 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 Nevada as well. So if you look around the country, while there were some places where the Latino vote 
uh, was not quite as monolithic as people have been discussing this whole cycle. It was very strong Latino night for Vice President Biden overall across the country. Yeah, except that you can't take away Miami-Dade out of the conversation because that's a pretty big part of the conversation. So can you explain what you think happened in Miami-Dade, what was different, what connected? Yeah, let me just put that in perspective, though. It gets a lot of attention because it's in the state of Florida, which is, uh, was, of course, a critical state. It also came in early. So if, mm -hmm. if uh, Arizona had come in first for whatever reason, the way we count ballots, we would be talking about the historic vote in Phoenix and Tucson. But Miami is only 3% of the entire overall Latino population. Now, it is true that uh, President Trump um, had some increases there, but that is predominantly with the Cuban-American population, who is overwhelmingly Republican. And one issue was that in 2016, he underperformed with Cuban-Americans, because if you recall, Mika, he spent the greater part of the presidential primary bashing Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, two prominent Republican yeah. Cuban-American senators. So they came back home. They have been Republicans for decades. They came back home a little bit. But overall, again, put it in a national perspective, the Latino vote was very strong for Vice President Biden, coming in around 70 percent nationwide. Hey, Matt, it's Willie. Good to see you this morning. You're right. I mean, if you look at the voting in, in Texas and you look at the voting in Arizona, Joe Biden is about in line with where Hillary Clinton was four years ago. And in fact, in Miami-Dade County, he was close to in line, and it was it was Donald Trump who added 200,000 extra votes in that county. So there's a lot inside uh, inside those numbers. But wasn't the idea that every four years, as the demographic changes continue in this country, and Democrats believe those were good for them, that you would exceed where Hillary Clinton was, and that you would have had this big thrust forward four years later for Joe Biden as compared to Hillary Clinton? Well, I think you see that in many places. I mean, let's continue to look at Arizona, which is still a state that the vice president's doing well in. That state has added 150,000 U.S. born Latinos under the age of 24 in just four years, 150,000. That's going to end up being the margin of victory there. Florida is a different state because while the Latino population is growing, there's also a continued abundance of white seniors who are moving there from the Northeast. So the demographic changes in Florida are quite different than what you see in other regions. Texas, for example, which is going to increasingly get competitive. You know, I know the Democrats didn't get this year, but it's going to increasingly get competitive. That is a state where you're adding, you know, about a million Latino eligible voters every four years. So continue to, to watch those places. We're already seeing that, Willie, in Arizona. That's a state that's flipping this year because of the strength of the Latino vote. Kurt Bardella, another look at the Senate races. Right now, the GOP has 48 seats. Democrats have 47. There are still five races that haven't been called. North Carolina is too close to call this morning. Arizona's Senate race is too early to call, although Mark Kelly has declared victory. Alaska is too early to call. And in Georgia, one race is heading to a runoff. In the other, David Perdue leads John Ossoff right now by a roughly 2.4 percent. Uh, but it's worth noting that if neither candidate finishes up over 50 percent, a runoff would be triggered in that race as well and could determine Senate control. Yesterday, Democratic Senator Gary Peters was able to hold on to his seat in Michigan and in Maine. Republican Senator Susan Collins was declared the apparent winner of her race. Uh, Kurt, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, there's different ways this could go. I mean, there is a path to Democrats having the majority. There is, Mika, uh, you know, but I think we're all being realistic, just as we are with yes. uh, Vice President Biden's chances now of winning the presidency. I think that we are all preparing for the likely reality that Mitch McConnell will continue to hold on to the slim majority in the U.S. Senate. I mean, I think nowhere is the polling being off more evident than in the Senate races uh, that we've seen. I mean, Susan Collins was left for dead. Uh, Jamie Harrison was supposed to be within, you know, earshot here of, of competing with Lindsey Graham. Uh, a lot of the places that a lot of resources were, were dispatched and sent and a lot of attention was given uh, turned out not to even be close. And so when we have this conversation about polling, uh, I think that uh, in the Senate races, it was particularly expensive and damaging for the Democrats 
that uh, the polling did not seem to add up with what the reality turned out to be. There's still going to be, I think, a huge showdown. Obviously, in Georgia, the runoff for at least one of those Senate races will be, uh, I think, January 4th. I know that the Lincoln Project will look to be very active in that contest. Yeah, any time that you can have any seat, one seat flip, that, that, that's worth putting some time and energy in. And the narrower the lead uh, that Mitch McConnell has in the Senate, that gives Democrats some semblance of leverage uh, to try to be influential and impactful. McConnell's already uh, lining up yeah. his troops to be ready to make things difficult for the Biden administration, looking to control the type of cabinet that Biden can assemble, the type of hearings that he can have, uh, having the, 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 the power of the gavel in the Senate. Uh, we have seen what kind of havoc and, and how tough Republicans can make it on Democrats and a Democrat administration with that type of power. So uh, you know, we, are, we are looking at what's going to be a very, very, uh, I think, very tough four years ahead of us with a lot of gridlock yeah. uh, and, and a lot of dissension. Well, you've sort of led me to my question, Kurt. You've worked in the Congress. You know how the, the levers of power work there. How do you think it looks with, let's say, for argument's sake, Joe Biden wins Pennsylvania, maybe even today, and gets over that 270 threshold if he does become president of the United States? He knows Mitch McConnell. They worked in the Senate together for many years. Does that give you any hope, or do you think that Mitch McConnell is the guy he is, and he's going to sort of stand in the breach of anything that Joe Biden and Democrats want to get done? I think Mitch McConnell has shown us, Willie, exactly who he is, and more importantly, so the people that, that, that serve under him, people like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Lindsey Graham and Ron Johnson, who are all still there. Uh, the, the ingredients remind me a lot of what we experienced after the Obama win, which was Republicans used whatever influence, whatever attention they could get to try to derail every step of the Obama White House as Obama was.